camera all right. Hello and welcome to the Byzantine Scotist. Today I have uh, Kevin Vallier with me to discuss his new book, All the Kingdoms of the World, which is, I think, a very, very strong critique of integralism. Because even though I disagree with um, Dr. Vallier on many things, and we'll get into some great discussions here, I think he actually does a very good job really interacting with primary integralist sources. And so I was very glad to see that. So welcome to the show, Dr. Vallier. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I just see you as sort of a, a, a sui generis person. And I, I've now you know listened to a lot of your podcasts and things. They're just excellent. <laughs> so well, thank you. It's really <laughs> great. It's just really great to be here. Um, I just, man, your Suarez, your Chipotle Le Suarez lecture was just a lot of fun. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So yeah, I wanted to start off with maybe you could talk a bit about the book and how you got interested in the subject and so on. Sure, sure. Um, it, it's it's a it may be a little surprising to your audience, um, but here's the story. So um, in my teens, and I got to Washington University in St. Louis in in 2000. I was actually working on the Gore campaign, and then I started <laughs> to meet libertarians and conservatives. I'd entered as an atheist, and I met a number of graduate students at uh, St. Louis University which are kind of under the care of, of Eleanor Stump. Uh, she was having Richard Swinburne visit, and uh, I decided after spending time with them that Christianity made a lot of sense. Um, in the meantime, at conferences, I had met Ed Fazer. And Fazer was a bigger influence on me than anyone else philosophically as an undergraduate. I became a Thomist. Um, I, he convinced me that God exists by rational argument. Um, and at that time, Ed was a libertarian. He just written a really nice book on Nozick. And over the course of the years that I knew him, he had this like major shift away from libertarianism to what we might think of as a kind of sort of integralist ideal uh, position, even though we weren't calling it that at the time. And it was really earth shattering for me intellectually. Um, so, you know, not, when I'm 19, 20, 21, I'm thinking, oh, man, you know, uh, these critiques of libertarianism are true. Sh you know, should I go over away from a totally rights based theory to sort of an ultimate good based theory? Um, and, 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 and I kept thinking about that, but then I got into graduate school and I wanted to get a job. So I started doing kind of more normy liberal analytic stuff, um, which has been a lot of fun. Um, but since I've got tenure a few years ago, I thought, okay, you know, now I'm going to go back to some of these questions. Well, I was going to do positive political theology and I started blogging a little bit and, and then, uh, Oxford's politics division decided that they wanted to commission a book on integralism of all things. And at some point one day, the, uh, invitation came to me. Um, and I thought, well, this is a little bit of a detour from what I wanted to do, but there was something really elegant about the integralist position, which is um, a little bit like act utilitarianism uh, in, in normative ethics. It's sort of very, very simple, but maybe has what many would regard as untoward implications, right? So it's like, what should we do? We should, we should promote the good. What else should we do? Um, <laughs> and, you know, the integralist position is much more subtle than that, right? But as a political theology, it has a kind of default position, in my view. Um, you know, you, you have to explain what's wrong with the view. And I thought it'd be a good exercise and it'd be a chance for me to get beyond, you know, the theory of practical reason and goodness that I thought uh, made the view plausible and then work my way through a lot of the history and, and canon law and historical sources. So that's how it happened. I, I, I've come back to the questions that once animated me. So it's been a whole lot of fun. Yeah, thank you for that. Um... So maybe we could start off with you saying that there is actually some things you find attractive about integralism. Yes, well, I yes. was surprised by your book that sort of you have five main arguments in your book and two of them are pro-integralism, which I was yes. taken aback by. And so I was wondering yes. if you could go into what sort of things do you find very attractive and positive about it? Sure, sure. I, I, one thing to emphasize in, in the book is I distinguish, I'm mostly focused on arguing for and critiquing integralism kind of at its best. And so, you know, actually there's some kind of, mainline Vatican II uh, Catholic conservatives that um, are actually pretty frustrated with me um, for not talking about, oh, in the real world, it would be a nightmare or whatever. I wanted to think about the ideal. Um, and even though I do talk about some of the difficulties in transition, it's still transitioning to, to the ideal. So, so that's just an important thing to understand from the, from the outset. Okay, so let's just define integralism. I'll, I'll just go ahead and give my definition, which for those of you who know is, is draws very heavily on Calder Mellerman um, and his doctrine of the indirect power of the, 
the Pope. Okay. So roughly, I think about integralism as a kind of constraint on the set of ideal political regimes. Okay, There's a lot of diversity in potential integralist views, but, but here, here's the, the sort of constraints. The two are very easy, very biblical, very traditional. Uh, first, God establishes a sort of a, a natural power, say a monarch or human regime, to govern the temporal common good, to promote it, right? Um, you know, every, that's fine. Like everyone should believe something like in that vicinity of that. Uh, that are Christians. And then God establishes the church in a distinct way to govern the sort of ultimate or supernatural good of the, the person. Now, of course, these things bleed into each other, leading to lots of complications. But those two authorization moments are to two of the three conditions. And this raises the striking question, which is how are these two powers to relate? Now, today, most people think, well, they should kind of respect each other's boundaries and leave each other alone. Um, but this is not the church's historical view at all. For centuries and centuries, this is not the view. There's a range of positions. You have some extreme like Gallican or a Cesaro Papist or Rastian views that say, look, the king can interfere not with dogma, but with ecclesiastical affairs. For instance, he could try clerics in his own courts. Um, and then there's a kind of extreme hierocratic view where the Pope has all kinds of temporal political power. Integralism comes in uh, especially in Bellarmine's work, is a kind of moderate position. It's considered extremely reactionary today. But, and it says, look, um, the two powers are concerned with promoting the ultimate human good. God must suppose, as Leo XIII would later say, that there's an orderly connection on the order of the relationship between soul and body. So, you know, there are some automatic processes that the state attends to, that the body attends to, but it's really the soul, right, that gives the body its point, right? And so the church should relate in this way, that this, the, the body is essential to the realization of the soul, right? But there should be an integration and a kind of indirect sovereignty. So what does that mean? Well, here's, I think, what's, what's central. The Pope can't say, oh, look, people need to eat to go to mass. So I'm going to take over all the, you know, big farms. Like they can't, he can't do that, <laughs> right? Um, but if there's, the, if there's a sharing of heretical sources, um, if, you know, there are people in really grave sin in ways that affect the mission of the church, then the thought is a Christian state, as Tom Ping would put it, should make its jurisdiction available to the church for religious ends. This is why historically the state would sometimes be described as the secular arm of the church. So there's an indirect, there's an indirect sovereign, so supernatural sovereignty condition, as I call it. But in Bellarmine's time, it's the indirect power, although our understanding of the term power is a little more uh, crude these days, because he would mean like indirect authority or something like that. Um, so that's why I call it indirect sovereignty. Um, okay, so so take take that to be something like uh, the integralist uh, position. Um, okay, so what are what are two arguments for it? Um, one of them I already alluded to, but let's go in order. So the first is I just wanted to look at the sources. Um, I just wanted to go back and uh, look at the history and the tradition. Now, one of the things like most religious opposition to uh, liberalism has is, you know, they're the ones that believe that the scriptures or the teachings or the ecclesiastical authorities, right? It's like they're the ones who prioritize them first and foremost and are going to believe them before they believe anybody else. I mean, you, you very much embody uh, this tradition in your own, in your own thinking. Um, and I think I, I don't, I don't weight it like quite as heavily as you, but I do. Um, and a lot of these sources are, you know, even though I'm Eastern Orthodox, are, are pre-schism. So, like, they have authority for me, too, even though sometimes Orthodox forget this. Um, so, you know, I'm looking at, like, Pope Calasius and, like, well, I mean, he was legitimate Pope <laughs> to Orthodox. Um, and so, you know, I'm thinking, oh, man, what's going on here? Well, here's what's going on. Um, the Western Roman Empire has collapsed. You have lots of little states or barely states. And the church has to come in and fill the state capacity to provide all of these social services. And this raises all kinds of questions about how the church is going to relate to the state. Over time, what's going on is that many theologians are looking at this arrangement and they're seeing a lot that's attractive about it. Because the thought is, oh, look, you can promote the spiritual good. And there's all, all these Byzantine emperors kind of messing with all of this stuff. And over here, you know, um, we've, we've got a little bit of a freer hand. Now, that isn't entirely true. Uh, you know, and sometimes it's just false at various points in Western European history. Um, but as the states start to grow, particularly the French state, um, there starts to be a more equivalent power between church and state, particularly at the high point of 13th century France. Um, and so what you see in that case is this kind of harmonious relation, say, between, you know, St. Louis and Clement IV, who was his advisor. Um, and what you what you see is, oh, look, they can they don't have to fight each other like they can 
help each other. Like they can, you know, put it crudely, bargain. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and and the, the thought here is that, you know, look, the, the church is always saying that the Pope has certain authority. I mean, you get forgeries like the donation of Constantine and stuff, but that kind of lead people into the hierocratic direction, actually. Um, but in general, the thought is, yeah, there should be some kind of harmony. Now, that quickly becomes infeasible uh, after the Reformation and the Thirty Years' War because you've got these big European powers. Um, uh, but the thought is it's still the, it's still the ideal. Um, it's still what the counter-Reformation theologians are defending. I mean, Victoria's indirect power, Bellarmine's indirect power, Suarez's indirect power. Um, a variety of things obviously happen until you get to the 19th century, but then you've just got a bunch of popes that are boom, 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 um, on board with it. Um, and I think this is clearest in Immortality Day and Leo the Thirteenth, because I think of him of sort of the 19th century popes. This he's really extraordinary uh, mind. In fact, I came away studying him more impressed with him uh, than than anyone else. Um, and so you've got someone into the 20th century looking like he endorses the indirect power. That's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary. You know, even though it was the moderate position, you could always hold it. I mean, Bellarmine almost got in trouble with Pope Sixtus V, who died, then died before you get in too much trouble. But nonetheless, um, it was just a, a moderate, just a moderate theological position that many, many people held that kind of fit the history. Um, Aquinas, you know, you read De Regno, it's like, this is integralism. And I know there are Whig Thomists who want to say, well, you got to read all of his stuff as a whole, and then you'll sort of de integralist de regno. But I'm like, well, I mean, you're really trying to avoid it, aren't you? A little too hard. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's the history I just, argument. I mean, that's, a, I, that's the first argument. Yeah. Yeah. I just uh, reread through most of the treatise on law in preparation for a class I'm teaching this semester. And, you know, it's just very clearly not a uh, liberal approach to law, I think. No. No, no, no. Although I will say, I mean, just just as an aside, um, I'm reading yeah. a nice new history of liberalism that emphasizes that liberal neutralism is actually out of step um, with with liberalism more broadly. And I, I won't go there too much. But nonetheless, um, yeah. it's still really different than any liberal view. OK, yeah, that's mm -hmm. correct. So so the history arguments, you, you look at historical development, the practice of the church, and then you look at the teaching of the church. And they make a kind of what I call just an abductive case, right? It's just integralism is a dogma, but it might be the sort of best explanation. Like if it were true, all of these teachings are unsurprising, right? But if like Vatican II, normy, you know, uh, Catholic conservatism is true, it is pretty surprising. And it looks like there's a really big discontinuity. Um, and it's in a short period of time because Immortality Day is just 80 years before Dignitatis Humanae. Um, and, I mean, that's such a tiny span of time. Here's another piece of the history argument that I think a lot of people don't know. If you read John Courtney Murray and Maritain, they know about the indirect power and they're direct, directly addressing it. They're like riding on it. And so even the liberals, they knew what they were up against, right? So they recognized what the mainline view was, and even though they wanted to change it in a certain way. Um, so, so, so all of these considerations, I just thought, okay, you know, these... But again, I've, I've angered some, again, sort of mainline Catholic conservatives because they're like, oh, that's misleading or that's misleading or that's misleading. And I say, look, you know, I make an accumulative case argument. I can't go into every detail of every one, but man, you stack them all together, they start to look pretty good. Okay, so that's the history. Yeah. Um, and it's, just, it's, just really, it's just really compelling. Now, the, the issue is, is that, go, sorry, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I was wondering with some of the history argument, you know, it's interesting you focus a lot on the Western tradition. Um, you know, you're Eastern Orthodox, and I'm curious yeah. if anywhere in your research, even if it didn't make it into your book, you engaged with it all the Eastern traditions. It seems that, as you're pointing out, it's not necessarily an integralist view, because there's not a subordination going on as much in the East. It seems much more like there are... <laughs> two connected powers, but not as much of the emphasis on the subordination aspect. And almost, you know, in, in practice a lot in the East, even though it doesn't necessarily show up in their theory, it almost seems to go the other way, you know, with like uh, Peter the Great abolishing the Patriarchate of Moscow or things like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, this is a great question, but the truth is I only became Orthodox in 2019 and I was studying Catholic and Lutheran thinkers uh, for just a very long time. And so I feel like I have a much better grasp and I just thought when I became Orthodox, you know, I mean, you, you will agree with this as a matter of praxis, but like it was just really mm -hmm. important to understand the liturgy and understand the practices of the church. Um, and so I thought when mm -hmm. I write what I knew um, and uh, and then with time, I start to understand the Orthodox position better. Now, I will say, I mean, 
if you think about the history of the undivided church, um, and, and you do start to include a lot of the Eastern fathers, that will complicate the history argument um, oh, for yeah. precisely the reasons that you you outline. Particularly, I think the most striking thing is uh, Byzantine emperors calling the ecumenical council. Well, the empress oh, calls, yeah. calls the last one, the seventh. But so, and, and that doesn't mean they have, but. It would complicate. It would complicate. Um, it complicate the case. Unfortunately, yeah. a lot of people completely ignore the East, and so you know it's easier to make make this argument of continuity. But I think you're absolutely you're absolutely right. You you bring in the East, it's going to complicate things. The trouble is, there's just not a lot of political theory in the East con compared to the West, and I think a lot of this has to do with institutional evolution, where people are just forced to think about all these questions, popes versus councils, popes versus kings, kings versus parliaments. And you just get this profusion of political thought, particularly the Reformation and subsequently. Um, and so there's just so much more to go on. And there's almost nothing in orthodoxy on like political treatises that are translated into English. That's um, fair. Yeah. In, yeah. Ha having taken a semester of Byzantine Greek, I don't know how anyone does that as their job translating that stuff, because I don't <laughs> think I understood it most of what we read that semester. Um, I can't do it. it it's very difficult Greek. Um, you know, one thing I found is really fascinating is that there's sort of this revival going on now, especially pushed by people like Adrian Vermeulo studying the, um, what is it? The code of Justinian as part yeah. of integralism versus, and it's interesting, you know, Justinian is canonized as a saint in the East, but not in the West. And I found that very interesting that it's the Westerners all talking about it right now. Yeah. I mean, the problem is that the East had the worst, like the 20th century was the worst for the East of like almost any mm -hmm. Christian group ever. Um, and so, you know, we're still recovering. Um, um, we didn't have a complete English edition that was well translated and edited of the Philo Kalia, um until what, a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. it, I mean, I mean, it's just wild how little we've been able to do um, just because our institutions were completely annihilated by communism and to a lesser extent Islam. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, I think that's, that's part of the, that's part of the reason. Um, so, so it, it was important when we were studying the canon law, understanding the uh, papal decretals and, and, and what exactly was going on and what Gratian is up to. Um, and then the ideal relationship between canon and civil law, because that was part of understanding what was involved uh, with integralism too, was this sort of integration of these legal regimes. And I actually think the one of the coolest, I don't think Vermeule will do this, but what would be extremely cool is if he said, okay, like here's administrative law. And here's canon law. And here's how they would be kind of stitched together under modern conditions. He could totally mm -hmm. do that. It would be awesome. I would learn a ton from it. Um, so I think that I would be, I'm not telling him what to write on. I'm just, I'm just saying it would be, be because there's this integration between these codes. Right. Um, yeah. 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 No, that would be fascinating. You know, one of the things I found fascinating in studying the treatise on law from St. Thomas is it's in a category that really fits nowhere in like modern, um, in a modern subject, you know, because he's mixing in like the metaphysics of participation with a philosophy of natural law, with a discussion of Roman law, with a exegesis of the Old Testament ultimately culminating with a treatise on grace and an exegesis of the New Testament on grace. And it's just a fascinating integration of various subjects there. <laughs> it is. I mean, I would like C.S. Lewis's line on the medievals and the discarded image. He says, you know, people think of them as like, like, uh, you know, heretic burners, but they're really more like clerks. Like every, there's a, there's a place for everything and everything has its place. And you just read scholasticism and yeah, it's just, you know, sometimes it's better organized in terms of separating the subjects. But in many cases, these folks are just drawing on so many different fields. Um, simultaneously, you didn't have the same divisions. You didn't have professions that were separated back then. Um, yeah, so it's just really extraordinary. Um, um, I mean, Aquinas is usually extraordinary, but uh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, I mean, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, one of the sections of your book I really liked was your treatment of Confucian integralism, where you point actually the Confucians have thought a lot more about what the regime would actually look like. You know, they get the advantage yeah. that they're only trying to look at how one country should be structured. Uh, yes. But as I was reading that section, it sort of thought that, you know, Catholic integralists should probably be reading Confucian literature right now in order to try and help think about these issues. Yeah, I mean, there's such a natural continuity between Confucianism and sort of and sort of Catholic natural law theory. I, I, that's one reason I think, you know, many of the Jesuits were able to take to um, uh, Con Confucian culture pretty quickly. Um, it's the same reason why I think it, you can get from Protestantism to Islam fairly quickly because of the emphasis on, you know, the height 
of scripture. So that's actually why I wrote on Islam and Confucianism rather than other stuff, because I knew enough Catholicism to enter into Confucianism. I knew enough Protestants to really feel like I could enter into Islam. Um, and yeah, Islam, there's no two powers. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very different. And Confucianism's weird because there isn't an ecclesiastical center. And one of the most curious things, and this would be, again, fascinating thing to hear uh, from Vermeule about, because he's been a student of the Chinese uh, state for a very long time, which is that in many ways, Confucianism was a religion or practice or an ethical code for the bureaucracy. I mean, the Chinese develop a state much earlier on. But if someone's like has, you know, a little bit of Buddhism popularly, they're not going to try to keep that out. And even today, the Confucians are, yeah, you can sort of do what you want as long as it's not Christianity or Islam, because they will totally destroy order because they'll just convert everybody. And so you get like, you got to be worried <laughs> about them. But the continuity with Confucianism that's important, I think, um, is that you ultimately want a serious, stable society and you want it to be based on morality and virtue and harmony with the divine. So there'd be Tian or heaven in, in the case of Confucianism. And then, you know, it's, it's not clear how agentive uh, heaven is. Um, sometimes they say you love people, you receive its mandate. Sometimes they treat it as just like an objective moral standard. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, you could say it's like the form of the good um, and then you're up and running. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of continuities. Um, and, and even today, I mean, I have this image of Jiang Xing, you know, the leading Confucian integralist, or so to speak, you know, meeting up with like Islamic and Catholic integralists and stuff and having a conference and a big conversation. It would be, you know, because because yeah, Jiang, what he does in his his book, his book is like really outline what Confucian institutions would look like. Um, and, you know, it's pretty strange. Um, let's say it's tricameral legislature, symbolic monarch, who's a descendant of Confucius. Um, but it's, it's really um, well thought out in terms of trying to address certain kinds of uh, incentive issues that I, I think um, Catholic integrals could, could benefit from. So, Yeah. No, I thought so, too. As you were sort of describing the ideal regime, I was like, that's almost putting words on what I've been thinking about for a while. And so I really like that part of the book. Oh, great, um, great. Yeah. One part I, um, we, we discussed one of your arguments for integralism, the history one, which, you know, to me is sort of my, uh, one of my approaches to it, but then you have another chapter on, um, the symmetry argument for it. Yeah. And here I felt that the symmetry argument, you know, from my perspective, I almost didn't find it all that convincing for integralism. And I'd be curious to ha discuss that a bit with you. Cause you yes. basically go in this sort of syllogism that there's, yeah. Are natural goods the state ought to promote? And if they ought to promote the natural ones, then they should promote the supernatural ones as well. Um, yeah. And it's all that second condition I defend in the whole chapter. I mean, you know, and it's yeah. very complicated. There's a lot of subtleties there. So I can see people who are resistant to it. Yeah. Because I could easily see, you know, from coming at it where, okay, I agree with that conditional, but I could easily see how someone pushes back. And I was glad to see you defend in the chapter sort of the new natural law approach as the alternative rather than actually going towards liberalism. And I was curious if you could talk a bit about why you took that approach. Oh, wow. That's a fun question. I have a bunch of reasons. Um, let's see. I have to organize them in my mind. The first reason is, well, one of my reasons is a strategic reason is I, I want the new natural law people to start taking this seriously. Um, and they don't. Um, and so at least except for some third generation in and else. Um, and so I wanted to make an argument that they're in real trouble. There's actually, I've discovered a few arguments since then I could have made it even worse. Um, um, so, so, you know, I ran this by a lot of them um, and, you know, we kind of worked it out and yeah, there are a number who think, yeah, you know, um, you know, we have to take this seriously. So one reason is, you know, a, a big part of the book is that I didn't write it to shut down or smack down integralism. I wrote it because it was an interruption in a way of the politi positive political theology. And I want that community to be as rich and robust as it as it can be. Right. And so the thought is, I just want to I just want to loop people in. So that was one of my reasons. It was sort of more strategic. The other one is I really didn't want to defend liberalism again because I've written three books on liberalism and I'm getting kind of tired of it. Um, so I wanted to challenge myself to do something different. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I also think it's really cool to try, like intellectually challenging, to try to defend um, integralism without presupposing any liberal position. So, so I actually have an article online against, against integralism that I didn't include in the book that I called the fairness argument that ultimately came chapter six, but 
chapter six is so different than that article. They're really distinct. And I didn't realize in it until like in and L's like Finnis and someone pointed it out um, that I had an, I did have an argue, uh, a premise in there that was question begging against uh, the integralists. And so, you know, I thought, OK, look, you know, it would be really valuable if I can just sort of step out of, you know, my my frame, you know, and try to give arguments that would appeal to various different, uh, you know, versions of, 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 of Roman Catholic natural law theorists. Um, and so, yeah, I, I thought I thought it would be useful uh, for that reason. And in fact, some of the NNL folks that are the friend, friends of mine, my age, they do take they do take integralism a lot more seriously. And I think in part because, you know, uh, you know, we've been talking about these issues for, I don't know, five solid years. Um, you know, I've been working on that essay for, you know, like three years or so. Um, so, yeah, um, there are a lot of ways you could try to block the argument, but I really wanted to loop NNL in the picture. I really wanted to avoid any liberal presuppositions insofar as I could. Um, because, I mean, you know, what I really want to hear from integralists is, and the frustration I have, and I hope some some people in the audience at some point in the future will, will hear this and maybe agree, which is that maybe a couple of years ago, like some of the more popular integralists rebranded to post-liberalism, and then they kind of took all the integralism discussion esoteric. Um, like, they, I know they talk about it to people because I know people that, that know them, um, but they don't do the theory in the open. I think it's just such a shame. I mean, isn't that such a shame? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're just not at the stage in an integralist political movement where it's just a, it, it, it's not ready for prime time. Um, yeah. And this is the period of time where they should be building up the intellectual apparatus rather than hiding what they think um, or being evasive. And so, you know, one thing I, reason I wrote this book is, it, I mean, look, there's a certain there are a lot of sects of integralism. And I think most of the sects uh, are on board with 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 engagement, but just not all of them. Um, but yeah, I just really wanted us to just say, OK, look, let's just have the discussion in ideal theory. You can do the old move to say, oh, well, we're, we're not talking about what we should do now. We're just talking about what's ideal. I'm fine with having that conversation. And then, you know, we can just we we just send all these popular political questions about Viktor Orban and all this stuff. We'll just we'll just set them aside because we've got to figure out what's best. I mean, we're we're tr if we're Christians, we got to create a Christian society, right? I mean, that's just absolutely yeah. true. Christ is king over all, period, right? And so, you know, that that's just how we need to be thinking. And so I just really hate that some of the discussion has been has been kind of shut down or taken into back channels and discords and stuff that I hear about or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, and I, I agree there. You know, I think that there's a strong tendency for the culture war. And I think it was originally mostly America to take over all discussion. But now I'm discovering that sort of it's spreading from America over yes. into the European discourse as well. So, you know, I talk to people from Europe and I have a lot of friends there and they'll sound almost like they're an Americans in political discourse now in a way they didn't a little while ago. Um, it's more, it's more than Europe. So um, it, it's, it's, it's India. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, my most viewed tweet was me trying to be nice to them by saying, well, there are illiberals that are like more democratic or whatever. And then they're like, we're not illiberals. You're a liberal imperialist. Um, and I, I was just stunned. But apparently, you know, there's tens of millions of Hindutva on Twitter. And some of the arguments they were making and claims they were making were really similar to the sort of post-liberal critique of, of you know, of, of liberalism. Um, they were saying the exact same stuff. I mean, you know, there's no neutrality. You should go with true visa or false views. Um, you know, that we should be advancing as, you know, spiritual, spiritual life. Um, and, and Hindu politics has, you know, become more politic. Uh, and, and that's, you know, a gigantic civilization. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I would say, uh, you know, Western and Eastern Europe, the East is oftentimes positioning itself to be on the more conservative side. Um the so so much of Europe, I think uh, India is another case. I do think there are some Islamic countries uh, that have absorbed a, a bit of it, although I mean, the conservatives are still most ways in in charge unless the liberals just have a dictator, period. Just get a military guy in there. Um, uh, and China, you know, is just totally different in a variety of respects. So anyway, that's just to add, mm -hmm. I think there's yeah, a billion and a half people that are being polarized um, right now, maybe two billion or so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
One thing I was to ask you about going back to the new natural law discussion is you emphasize heavily sort of um, this new natural law approach. And you mentioned at one point there's some disagreements between them and sort of a more classical natural law approach. And um, yeah, I know we've also discussed this in the past some as well. So I wanted to touch on this a bit, which is that it seems to me and I'm not closely engaged at all with the new natural law stuff. So as coming at it from looking at it from the outside is that it does seem the new natural law approach downplays the metaphysics of the good and sort of yes. reduces it to simply these basic goods. But on the other hand, I can also see the argument for doing that because, you know, it's very hard from a classical natural law approach to actually pin down maybe a list of goods that might want to be pursued or to take that step. And so frequently then when pushed to do that, it ends up reducing to looking something like the new natural law conclusions. I was wondering if you could talk about that a bit. Sure. Now, um, my sort of uh, master and commander when it comes to natural law theory is Mark Murphy, who's the chair of Georgetown's philosophy department. He wrote this amazing book on natural law in 2001, which the NNL has totally ignored, which is I'm still, you know, I, I'm friends with a lot of them, but it's like, come on. I mean, this book is awesome. Um and in it, he makes this really interesting point about the contrast. So I'm going to give you the contrast and then give you what line of his that I accept. So the, the contrast is kind of metaphysics first or practical rationality first. And the metaphysics first view, the old natural laws, is say, well, we try to we try to cognize the human essence, right? And we try to give a story about sort of the teleology of the person and the teleology of the body and so on. So so you you tell the metaphysical story of teleology, right? Um and, and, and the old natural law folks are sort of really big on defending the existence of final causality, the final, just think about all of Ed Fazer's popular stuff. Like, what does he do? Mm -hmm. He's defending like final causality and so on because he doesn't like in and out. The in and out approach tries to start from like the inside. Like, how do, how do we choose things? And what are the things that are the ultimate object of choice? And so, you know, this is, this is Aristotelian. And I think that there's an element of this in Aquinas. Um, and so they're trying to think about just like the, the good as sort of part of practical reason. And what Mark says about the contrast is he said, those are actually two different ways of describing the same reality. It might just be the case that what the old natural lawyers are doing is describing the sort of outside metaphysical picture. What does a human person look like, right? What, what is its nature? And then the new natural law view is kind of from the inside, right? Like, what is it like to be a human chooser? And that's my view. Um, I think the hmm. contrast is just greatly overdrawn. Um, and I think actually, you know, Robbie George ends up saying at a point, but I can't remember if he co-authored on this, where he says, well, yeah, of course, the metaphysical is going to inform the practical. And I was like, oh, OK, that's great. How does it do mm -hmm. that? Um, um, mm -hmm. Because, I, you know, again, I'm just I just see I just see, you know, the, the, the contrast being overdrawn. So it's the inside versus the outside. Old natural law is the outside of humans, you know, looking in and new natural law is the inside looking out. Yeah. So yeah, I want to get back to that in a second, but first I want to tie in another one of your chapters in discussing this, which is sort of your first chapter critiquing integralism, which is this transition issue. I was wondering yes. if you could outline your primary argument in that chapter. Sure. Now, um, as a preliminary, we, we have to introduce a distinction that's pivotal in the book, and I need to say a little bit about its history to show that it's Catholic kosher. So... Um, when Pius IX handed down Quanta Cura, there are a variety of bishops that were terrified because they were worried that secular powers were just going to smash them, and particularly the more liberal leaning ones. And so I think he was a, a Quebec uh, bishop, uh, Dupinlou, um, who said, OK, well, what Pius IX is doing is he's talking about like the ideal, the thesis, he said. And, and what we should do like in the real world or transition, all that stuff, that's hypothesis or hy uh, hypothesis. But if you pronounce it that way, people get confused. So I just made up call it because it's below right below mm -hmm. the thesis right um and in fact tracing down the writings on this was pr really difficult um uh because a lot of the discussion was in quebec oddly enough i mean maybe it's not odd actually now that i think about it so you have this distinction between integralist what has to be ideal theory and then like the more non-ideal theory and what i'm trying to do is to go after the thesis and i want to say several things about what would make a political ideal defective? What, one thing, and then I'll come back to this, that makes an ideal defective is when it can't guide action about approaching it. So it's a very common view within analytic philosophy discussions of ideal and ideal theory. Um, but understand that, so your, view, your, you know, your listeners, 
This thesis hypothesis distinction was introduced. Pius IX apparently grudgingly accepted it. And then it did something really striking, which is it became a way of defending integralism against liberals. It said, well, integralism is the ideal. I mean, yeah, maybe liberalism and hypothesis or whatever. It's a good way to make peace and prudence for now. But really, no, this is still the church's ideal. And so now this is Pink's view. It's a thesis, you know. And in fact, Vermeule mm -hmm. has even said as much. There was a, there's a, the, the discussion he had. Sorry, this is, a, is my <laughs> environmental thing. Uh, I should have warned you about it. Um, there we go. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, um, so what happens is um, it, there was this, this, it's still, it's on YouTube and you can look five years ago, it's Deneen, uh, Philip Munoz, uh, Gladden Pappen and Adrian Vermeule on stage. And Pat says, integralism is crazy. And Vermeule, it's funny given what's happened. Um, hmm. And Vermeule says, well, Pat, you know, what about it? You know, it may not be practical now, but what about it as an ideal? And when I listened to that some years ago, I thought, Mm, this is interesting. And if you, I mean, I, I can't follow every mural anymore. Um, but when I did for several years, um, uh, he would periodically tweet about the distinction. And I realized, you know, you know, they understand, like they recognize that they're nowhere close to the ideal. Um, I just think that has some problems. But the first thing to understand is that thesis hypothesis distinction was kind of taken on in the church. And it's very, very interesting that when it came time to go after integralism, both Murray and Maritain went off after the thesis hypothesis distinction. What Murray, what Maritain says ultimately in The Man in the State, after recognizing the indirect power and it being an idea on the primacy of the spiritual almost 50 or uh, 30, 25 years before, is he says, look, integralism may have been, a, he didn't call it that, but it would have been appropriate for the sacral age, but it's not appropriate in the secular age. So it's not a universal ideal. It's not something we should always go to. And Murray, this is really fascinating, just totally fascinating. He says, we're going to abolish the distinction. We're just going to do away with it. Um, and that's how we're going to get to, to liberalism. I mean, he doesn't put it that obviously. Um, and so, you know, then you want to say, oh, there's like no best Catholic regime. Like it's just all relative to historical circumstances or what have you. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, what integralists want to say is, well, I mean, there's still a best. Right. Like, I mean, it would just be, you know, and the church has kind of taught this. It makes a certain kind of philosophical sense. Um, and so one of the things I decided that I would try to do is to sort of clarify what the distinction even is, because here's a problem with the thesis idea is um, there's a similar kind of approach in both liberal and socialist ideal theory. So socialist contemporary, like analytic socialism, you get this view that there's like justice and there's feasibility and Justice is justice, even if it isn't feasible at all. And I think no natural law theorist can actually think that radical of a separation, because what would justice be if it were connected, not unconnected to what we're capable of? Um, um, but they assume, you know, you could get totally different behavior out of human beings in, in some respect or another. Now, liberals do this, but not quite as much. Um, and you've got kind of Rawls's model of a realistic utopia where people sort of fully comply with the institutions that are just. It's called a strict compliance or full compliance assumption. There's no sin in the model. So you can't use those models in making sense of the thesis because the thesis has to have sin in it or it's just, there's no, ra what's the rationale for integralism? If there's no sin, what do you need the church for? Um, so it can't be an ideal in like the maximal sense right? It has to be somehow a little dirtier than the liberal and socialist ideals, just, just, just to put it in an odd way. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so then the, okay. So with that distinction, that will be relevant for all three of my counter arguments. So that's why I just want to lay it out. Yeah. Okay. I want, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to push, first of all, I just want to say if anyone hears anything in the background, that's just my one-year-old he's being taken care of, but sounds like he's having a meltdown there. So, um, but, okay. um, in terms of that ideal, I agree very much with that ideal hypothesis distinction you're making there. Um, you know, it's interesting that that seems to come up very early, even within the recent magisterium on this, because um, Leo XIII is already drawing this distinction when he's talking about Raleigh Mott. 
And so, um, you know, the French, they can still be involved in the French government, but we have to uphold the ideal that we wish the French Republic would accept the Catholic faith again. Um, yes. But in terms yes. of... Oh, and I should add, can I just add, let me just add this yeah. one thing. In his letter to the American Catholics in Longinqua, um, he says, look, the confessional state's still the idea. I mean, y'all, he's like, y'all are great. Like, you've done a good mm -hmm. job. But like, don't forget. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And on that note, you know, I want to mention that a lot of people jump very quickly to the Americanism sections of Longinqua, or they'll jump very much to seeing, you know, these Catholic countries all had monarchies and the U.S. is a republic, so the U.S. never had anything good. And I'm like, no, if you read the founders, they were very aware of a lot of the classical tradition. And I think there's many ways in which there's very good aspects of the Constitution that even an integralist could say are very good. But mm -hmm. on this point about the yeah. ideal, there, I want to push back a bit on that because okay. I think that the way that integralism is formulated by a lot of people now it is very much the case that the ideal requires that there be sin involved so that part of the job of integralism is the protection from sin. But yes. Suarez draws this distinction between how things were before the fall and how they were after the fall. And he says that before the fall, there still would have been government, but the purpose of that government would have simply been directing towards the common goods, right? If you're on like a football team, for example, right? There's many different good ways you could pursue a victory, but obviously you need a coach to direct everyone because if everyone made up their own play, it wouldn't work. And so it seems to me that integralism still would have been the ideal if not for the fall, but it wouldn't have involved coercion at all. It simply would have involved directing people towards a higher spiritual good. And I'd be curious if you think that would play a significant role in how critics of integralism would approach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it would uh, actually play into the critics' hands because they would just say, yeah, this only makes sense that there's no sin. Um, and then like mm -hmm. all the hardcore Augustinian uh, uh, Christian political theologians, excepting Pecknell, um, mm -hmm. um, would just would just, you know, go go have a party with that at uh, admission. Mm -hmm. And also, I actually think integrals don't agree uh, internally about this. I, you know, Alan Femister mm -hmm. told me, yeah, if if uh, we were, you know, if we were pre-fall, the Pope would rule. Because, mm -hmm. like, why would you appoint a king? Like, the, and he says, like, there's instrumental reasons for God to appoint a king because the Pope can't do too much, right? And, mm -hmm. and he says you're going to get simony and stuff if the Pope is doing political stuff. So, I actually, I, I actually think that can't be the integralist position. But you know, Alan Femister's, you know, Alan Femister's. So. See, that's actually interesting. I agree with Finister there. When you brought up Finister, I thought he was going to have the opposite position because of his view of Christology. Because I've laid out an article where I argue that oh. I think some of these differences come out Christologically. If you accept the Thomas position that the kingship of Christ is dependent on sin, then I think your political theory at least should follow with that. And I think, at least in the ah, emphasis, good, you good. see a lot of them put... So you see a lot of the integralists still put the emphasis on the issue of sin versus, I think... This is about sort of my one article for New Polity I've written, is I think that's actually the wrong emphasis. The integralist shouldn't be putting the emphasis on direction towards the good, and then saying direction towards the good accidentally requires, because of the fall, a dealing with sin, which is going to involve the separation of the two powers as well. But and that's because I think, you know, that's the way God ordered the cosmos originally, that Christ would be directly the king of all things if it wasn't for the fall. Yeah. And I think that's what we're going to see eventually uh, as well. Um, yeah. So, I mean, but the, also, I mean, my view, my view on this is just pre sin and, you know, and eschatologically, I mean, saying much about political, political conditions under them is just going to be just really, really hard to do. Um, mm. So, so I, I'm never quite sure what to make of, of those, those things. And I, I, I would need to think, I would need to think more about it. What matters for the yeah. integralists though, I think is that, um, they are talking about and overwhelmingly talking about the real world. Now, let me draw a little contrast. I think it's really, really important also for uh, at least chapters four and uh, five on transition and stability. Um, the integralists have a critique of what I like to call, um, and I, I wish I'd play this up a little more in the book, of what I'll call the mere natural law state. So this is a state, all it does is teach the natural law and enforce it. That's it. No grace, no church. Or maybe there's the church, but it's not, it has no kind of sovereignty of any kind. Um, and what integralists many say, um, I actually talked to Patrick O'Neill a little bit about this. Um, 
uh, is, I think he wrote something on this, um, about how uh, that state will degrade because of sin. Mm -hmm. So two things will happen. One is people will lose their knowledge of the natural law to some degree. Um, and also they'll be less able to follow it because the supernatural virtues won't be helping them out. Um, and so I think uh, there is this qualitative prediction. Um, it's, you know, it's not anything very specific that the mere natural law state will kind of be less stable and will be more subject to decay. Um, and so I think when the case for integralism is made, it is made on the basis of sin. And I think integralists have a very strong doctrine of sin as it affects reason. So this is one of the most interesting features. Is and, and I'll say this, I think you'll find this interesting. I think it was both the kind of phaser old natural law and the Robbie George new natural law, they couldn't make the case, I think, very strongly against the sort of uh sort of LGBT movement, in part because um, and this is I think what integralists would tell you, maybe maybe behind closed doors, is that look, your your arguments were never gonna get through. Like they were never gonna work because there's just too much sin. Um, and so this is exactly what we would expect in a liberal order where sin is just given free reign. Um, those arguments just weren't going to pass muster. But if you go back to them 15 years ago, they're like, reason can see this. Reason can see this. It doesn't matter who it is. Reason can see this. Um, and I think the integralists, you know, have a nice explanation. Look, Robbie, look, Ed, you re and I think Edward is on board now with this. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, look, I mean, you tried a lot at mm -hmm. length and you had almost no success whatsoever. Now, why would that be? Um, so yeah, I think there's a way in which the integral is just like strongly Augustinian when it comes to, to, to grace and the corrupting effects of grace on, on reason. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of these folks are appealing to Thomas when in an age where, you know, you might argue if you're an integralist that there's kind of more grace, uh, involved in politics. Um, and so it's a mm -hmm. little bit easier for people to see the natural law, um, so, so that's kind of what I think is to, to stress how much sin is part of even the integralist ideal, because part of the rationale for integralism is you simply have to grace the state or things are just going to be, I mean, ultimately there'll be demonic rule. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think if someone adopts a sort of strict neo-Thomist separation between nature and grace, that they're going to then have to appeal in order to reject a, um, purely natural law state, a strong Augustinian view of sin, as you're saying. Yes. But I'm yeah. not sure if that's the case necessarily if one adopts a less strict distinction between nature and grace. Because if you oh. accept that man, because right, in the strict Neotomist view, right, there's two ends of man, a natural end and a supernatural end. Yeah. But sort of in a lot of the integralists, you know, are also Neotomists. So they're going to be arguing from that perspective. But there's also the whole tradition that I think you see in someone like um, John Milbank's approach to um, integralism, where he's critiquing um, this strict separation between nature and grace. And I think he collapses the two way too far. But I agree with him partly that there does seem to be too much of a separation between nature and grace and that I would not say that man actually really has two ends. I think that the natural end is only sort of a hypothetical that we have, but the real end of man is supernatural according to his nature. And so I would wonder hmm. then if that affects things that I don't think there could ever be a simply natural law state, because I think that wouldn't account for the fullness of human nature. Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, I think the integralists are just taking for granted that there, there's at least a stable distinction conceptually, whereas mm -hmm. you're proposing that there isn't a stable conceptual distinction. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, obviously, you know, the Orthodox, you know, want to tie grace and, and nature more closely together um, mm -hmm. as well. But I hadn't actually thought about that making trouble uh, yeah. uh, for for integralists, um, because you, you might think of it like this, right? Like, Suppose like you have a closer nature grace distinction, but God can, without sin, God could still hide, right? Like there could still be facts about grace or degrees mm -hmm. of grace or whatever that were like reduced, but you wouldn't have sin. And so everyone would follow the natural law and everyone would grasp it. Um, um, but I think what you're actually saying is, is that even if there wasn't, hmm, I have to think yeah, about this. So you're not saying if there wasn't, what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, I'm saying like if there wasn't sin, right? I mean, we would all be able, I would say, to grasp the natural law. But yeah. I would say that there's still 
if you had the whole of the natural law but didn't have grace, it wouldn't really fully capture what a human is still. Um, in that, ah. this is sort of the issue is that the Thomists adopt strictly oh. Aristotle's position that in order mm -hmm. for there to be a something, a um, active potency, or really even just a potency of any sort within a nature, there has to be a natural way to fulfill that potency. And so, you know, Scotus actually potency. rejects that Aristotelian axiom and says that, no, there could very well be a potency within human nature to for the beatific vision, oh. and that only God could fulfill that, and that there's no natural way to fulfill that. And so that's sort of a dispute going on. You know, it's interesting. I think Thomas, in his conclusion, really agrees with Scotus here. And there's <laughs> a lot of dispute on Thomas on this, because I think Thomas's conclusion is inconsistent with his principles. That's where the Neo-Thomists get in it, is therefore following the principles. But I'll leave that to the Thomists to have their debate about that, uh, whether well, or not there's a little axiom I there. Yeah, you should do part two of your scotistic integralism stuff, mm -hmm. and you should talk about that. I think. I mean, okay. just as a, re a request from a listener, um, because that yeah. adds onto your sort of the two affections thing, which I thought was awesome. By the way, um, well, thank you. I mean, yeah, particularly this idea that seems obvious phenomenologically that we can choose between our good and the common good. Anyway, mm -hmm. but yeah, part two. If you, yeah, that, I would love it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where, um, you know, I think there's always been this tension within Catholic political thought between a very Augustinian biblical approach to political theology, where you're approaching things in terms of the biblical narrative, and there's a strong sense of change over time, and that there's sort of this great narrative and history going on, and the Aristotelian view, because Aristotle thinks the world is eternal, and so there's no fundamental change of what happens in time, and so there's an eternal ideal that is always just sort of being implemented now. And so Aristotle's concerned with the ideal constitution, but he's not concerned with sort of divine, how divine providence could play into that. And that's a tension, I think, within the whole Christian political tradition that's there, because we sort of accept both. That's very insightful. I hope you'll I'll say more. I hope you'll say more about that. And let, if you Thank already you. have, I, I mean, yeah. Um, no, I, yeah. I, I think that's very good. Your scotism yeah. is just like so illuminating it, anyway. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed this a little bit at the beginning of your book as well, this tension, because you lay out really two main approaches that could be taken to integralism. Sort of this very Aristotelian approach where you adopt an Aristotelian approach to natural law, then recognize that given divine revelation, this is going to require also the promotion of supernatural goods. Uh, but you also lay out this whole narrative of human history, yeah, you know, yeah. that starts off with man in the garden and then the fall and sort of this great Augustinian sto biblical story that's being told. And you sort of say, I'm going to set aside that whole issue. And I was curious, maybe you could touch on a little bit why you decided to set aside that other approach to the this discussion. Also has a, this also has a number of answers. <laughs> I had a um, kind of major Catholic intellectual who teaches a lot of young Catholic students and I was talking mm -hmm. about that scripture and, and she says to me, um, well, none of my, none of my integralist students care, care about mm -hmm. scripture, we're Catholics. And I was like, well, that's <laughs> not, don't be, you know, that's not very nice. Um, I mean, she thought it was, she was kind of joking. Um, and what I realized, I think, is there's like two, two kind of personality types that get into integralism. One is just like your super nerdy Steubenville undergraduate, right? Like, you know, and they get into it through studying Aristotle and Aquinas. And then you've got like, like the law students and stuff, you know, the people that are like intending to get into politics. And I think they're actually more motivated by the, the narrative um, because they see themselves as sort of picking up within salvation history. So I wanted, that's the reason I wanted them both there. Um, okay. But why, so, but why didn't I do more with the narrative? One, I'm not a good scriptural exegete. Mm -hmm. And I just don't. The main reason, I, one of the reasons I wanted to do it was just to actually explain the true meaning of the title because of the book. Because if you look at it initially, you think, oh, he's just saying integralists are like giving into Satan. No, no. What I say there is the integralist interpretation is like when Satan says, yeah, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, is that that was actually a credible offer. Or at least Satan mm -hmm. thought it was a credible offer. And there's two, there's a way to respond to this, which is we better grace every state as soon as possible hmm. because they're under demonic rule. The people are going to suffer. We have to exorcise the state. Right. And so all the kingdoms of the world is a Rorschach test. Right. It's two ways of approaching the biblical narrative, but it's also two ways of approaching politics. Right. Do we look and say, oh, we got to be liberal in the anti-power sense. Right. Or. 
do we have to take this much more active view about what the church is supposed to do in the world? Um, or at least actively political view. Um, and so, yeah, I do think there's like this deep biblical part of it. But another way in which you differ from many Catholics, uh, Catholic intellectuals is that you love to talk about the Bible, <laughs> you, <laughs> you know? And, and, and so, yeah, I think I could see why you're more attracted to that. I mean, I could be on a podcast with the Thomas and Bible wouldn't come up one time. Not to not <laughs> to be offensive or anything. It's just your yeah. your your work is just so much more scriptural. Um, so um, most people didn't want to don't want to talk about that part. And that's fair, yeah. And you know, I sometimes have a hard time stepping into the other side of like the world of analytical philosophy, where you can't just cite the Bible all the time because I'll just be something. <laughs> I'll be like, you know, I'm not sure how I could defend this, but I know it's true, <laughs> and yeah. I'll be citing and um. You know, something that I think you hit the nail on the head with really well, there are sort of these two groups of people who are going in to interest in integralism. You know, you have the kinds of people who would blog on something like you said, Justitium, where they're very interested in actually being involved in legal theory and the yeah. kinds of people who hang out at new polity conferences who want nothing to do with politics. Um, but I think, you know, the Aristotelian versus biblical approach, I almost feel it's the opposite of who is attracted to what. Because you see, um, you know, and I think this shows up in that chapter on transition, because Vermeule's approach to transition is we got to take over right now. You know, we have to find a way that we're going to take over. Liberalism is going to collapse soon. And so the way he goes about it then, right, is this has to be done now, almost because I feel like, and there's parts of Vermeule's transition theory I agree with, but one of the concerns I've had um, and it's not necessarily meant to be he's wrong, but a concern I've had is a de-emphasizing of the narrative. Because to me, you know, whether or not the integralist position wins in the end has already been determined. You know, I sort of think that history is this grand divine providence narrative. And so we're just sort of sitting here thinking, all right, once we take over, what it's, what's it going to look like? But I don't have significant concern about whether or not that is the case. You know, I don't know how it will play out. But if there is this grand biblical narrative and if Christ had this mission to the apostles to disciple all the nations, that includes a political discipling, then to me, I mean, Christ is going to accomplish that mission of discipling all the nations, regardless of how the details play out in history. And I'd be curious on how you think that plays into a transition theory. Yeah, I'm, actually, this is something I, I, um, I anticipated, um, but didn't feel like I could uh, uh, really talk about because you know, as far as integral as transition theory goes, there's just not a lot of it. And one one issue yeah. with a lot of the new polity people is they're so anti-statist um, that, you know, there's a sense in which they're not even really playing the same game. And what I wanted to do is I just thought Vermeule, like his critique of Andrew Willard Jones was just true, which is that all the oh, yeah. evils did was kind of hide the ball sovereignty, like sovereignty's there. Like you never get rid of, I know it's a Schmidtian point too, but like it's true, right? So um, yeah. sovereignty's always, someone holds it. Um, yeah. So you have to tell the story about the modern state, I think, because they're the ones who hold it. Yeah. And I think this plays into the second half of the narrative part that you had, where you had art, there's this narrative of liberal decline that happens. And we have this great decline in civilization versus one of the concerns, you know, I might have with the new polity position is that they think there's almost been like no real Catholic political theory since like the 13th century. And everything that's come since has been kind of bad. And I think, you know, I see these sort of these great empires going out and bringing missionaries with them throughout the world is a very important part of divine providence that has to be factored in. And I see figures like Bellarmine and Suarez doing a very important developments in Catholic political theory that have to be dealt with. And we can't just hide yes. in that because you're actually denying the narrative. You're retreating to an eternal truth then that was there in the 13th century. Mm -hmm. And you're denying mm -hmm. almost that God's been working for the last 700 years. And I think you know, one of the points that sort of the Josias, you say Justitium guys have done very well is saying, all right, we actually do have to accept the developments that have come since. And we have to wrestle really with the issues of modern philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, one of the things that's been so fascinating about studying the development of Catholic social thought is, I mean, Catholics are responding to con the conditions in Europe that are changing like all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, it, they never, you never really don't have Catholic political discussion 
from any period, like it doesn't really ever stop. Like it goes, sometimes there's more of it or sometimes there's less, but there's always something to fight about. Um, um, popes, councils, popes, kings, democracy, monarchy, re you know, revolution, reform, socialism, capitalism, you know, universal religious liberty, limited religious liberty. You know, it's it's just it, it just goes on the whole time. Um, and, and it's very continuous. And so when I actually read, instead of just like dismissing Murray and Maritan, when I actually read them, I mean, they're, they're actually trying to say, okay, no, no, here's, here's how it goes. Now I think, I mean, Maritan almost falls into historicism and Murray yeah. is just importing too much liberalism ultimately. But, um, in the same time, um, yeah, there's, it's just continuous, continuous discussion. And yet you cannot avoid, and this is where I think Vermeule is right that um, you cannot avoid Catholic social thought as it approaches the modern state. And he has an interesting, mm -hmm. this partly comes from his stuff prior to being Catholic, but, you know, he's been anti kind of limited government conservative for a really long time. Um, yeah. And I, I've met people that, that knew him long, long before any of this. And one of these common points, which is a, a point the left often makes, which is that, you know, conservatives have been trying to streak the, strangle the administrative state for 50 years and they've like completely failed. Um, and maybe there's some kind of like technological factor, um, particularly when when Vermeer will talk about complexity. Um, I talk about complexity economics in a lot more detail. Uh, he may just be complicated, but set that distinction to the side for the moment. Um, and the administrative state grows in a kind of logical way, and it, it, it gradually becomes kind of more consistent in its moral principles and takes them to a more abstract uh, order. And so, you know, he's thought very much about, well, how does the administrative state evolve? Why does it seem to resist? And one of the most fascinating claims that he makes, and I think this is this is a really weird claim, but it's really interesting, that he thinks liberalism can collapse, but leave the administrative state in place. So a lot of the times we think of liberalism collapsing, we think of the liberal state collapsing. But what Vermeule is saying is it's going to be more like when the Soviets collapsed, right? It's like the mm -hmm. ideology clears, clears out of the system and then new people come in because what Vermeule says is, you know, the technological functions of the state, you're going to have the military, you're going to have the tax apparatus. I mean, the, all this stuff is going to stay around. Um, and so, you know, if you have your Daniels in place at the right time and you have your Esters and so on, as he talks about in his own Christian strategy piece and first things, um, it's still going to be there. Right. And I think that's mm -hmm. a point that, that integralists really, you know, they, they, they've, they draw back from Vermeule because of the Schmidt stuff. But I mean, I think he has some really good points to be made about. I disagree with him on a lot of a lot of ways of thinking about the state. But I mean, they really need to do more to grapple with what Vermeule's saying about the necessity of the state. Yeah, and I completely agree there. You know, I read um, a little bit of his book, Common Good Constitutionalism, and quickly realized it's going to delve too much into constitutional political theory in a way I don't have any background in. But I was sort of reading his first chapter where he lays out his overall approach to um, how we should approach law, which is sort of where my competency was ending, was I was thinking, all right, this seems like a way that integralists of all stripes could pretty much agree with, where it is we have to take into account a really a more Thomistic approach to law that's going to factor in the natural law and the use gentium and so on. Um, yeah. You know, as the administrative yeah. state, that's really probably completely out of my competency. Um, it, I, I think his next book is going to be on common good administrative state. Okay, that'll be interesting to read, yeah. Yes. And one... Um, point of his that I find really interesting is his mention of these examples like Daniel and Esther and so on. Mm -hmm. But what I think is interesting is no one has really done stuff with that in that I think there needs to be a book basically or an article or something actually analyzing every case of integration from within in scripture and trying to get a scriptural theology of integration from oh, within. Oh, now that would be amazing. Um, uh -huh. I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you. One of the things that would be interesting also to tell the story is, you know, how did how did the takeover of the administrative state happen in the Roman Empire, right? I mean, people yeah. have told that story, but it'd be interesting, like who is moving, what elites are there. I'm sure people have worked on this. I'm told actually, upper class women uh, played a huge role um, from the little bit mm -hmm. I know. Um, but one of the more interesting things to return to Confucianism is actually the Confucians yeah. have a very developed sort of statecraft ethics, and they've had one for millennia. Um, and that's mm -hmm. another potential interesting uh, 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 point of discussion because, you know, liberalism's, I don't think this is really true of like 18th century liberalism. 
um, or even 19th. But like you get in the 20th century, this kind of anti-politics liberalism. And so you lose the theory of statecraft. Um, and I actually think, you know, you can kind of tell from some of your writings that he's reading some of these, you know, statecraft theorists. So, you know, he dropped something years ago about Botero. Um, um, the Région de Stato language comes from, I think, well, it's not originally Botero, but it's Botero. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, the stuff of, he's written with a, he oftentimes will write titles that are from Carl Schmidt, but like nobody knows. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, this is like one dare to command. I'm pretty sure that's a Schmidt one. I know the one that all conflict is theological or whatever. But um, yeah, he's talking about like, look, um, there's going to be a state. There's going to be some people commanding others and it better be us. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, other people say, well, that's against the gospel or whatever, but like people didn't think that for a really long time. Um, yeah. We just didn't really think they just thought, yeah, you can have good leaders and you can have bad leaders. And, you know, and then he has another argument, which I think um, he doesn't really make explicitly, but I actually think it's really interesting, um, which is that, um, there are all of these groups that are perfectly comfortable with statecraft and rule. Um, and it's a, just a weird feature of American Christianity that it's like so uncomfortable with it. And so the thought is, look, if someone's going to rule, like why wouldn't it be the people with the right values? Unless mm -hmm. you think some kind of neutralism could be worked out. And I have a limited version of that doctrine I would defend, but nonetheless, um, I think, yeah, if, if you're, you're in the anti-liberal intellectual space, right. Um, I think it's just mm -hmm. a perfectly reasonable point you can't get a premise one or whatever <laughs> can't you're not getting rid of the modern administrative state okay so you're going to have power right and then the question is and i know you know my father uh, my friend father rooney um but vermule kind of dunked on him with this one thing he's like <laughs> i'm reliably informed that the one thing god can't grace is the state um and and i and i i thought that well that's kind of a, that's a pretty integralist way of of thinking about this right like the state's going to be a necessity if it's a natural part of, of humanity, God, God, it can be graced and the God will offer his grace to it in the same way they offer it to the church. Right. In the same way he offers it to the individual. Right. And yeah, I mean, I make it's internally coherent um, uh, point. Yeah. Yeah. One um, point I wanted to bring up with you in this at the end of your book, you suggest sort of an alternative strategy, perhaps yeah. um, integralist should pursue, which is sort of similar to like what Steubenville was doing, where you have these small little local communities. Um, and you point out Mount Athos as sort of an ideal one, you know, where it's a community where they've come together and <laughs> it's essentially like a small theocratic society where these monasteries have come together and actually they rule all the laws and stuff there. And yeah. I thought that's interesting and I have sympathies with parts of that way but i wanted to offer an important pushback i think you don't consider in that chapter yeah. which is yeah. where mount athos is located which is in greece which is actually a confessionally orthodox state so even though the country of greece doesn't really actually do much in terms of orthodoxy and its laws you know it still pays greek priests under the gov a government salary it's still part of the government and mount athos is still under greek law in certain ways so for example when in the mid 20th century, there were old calendarists who didn't recognize the ecumenical patriarch on Mount Athos. They actually brought in the Greek military from outside to displace the old calendarists and remove them from the island. And so, know <laughs> you know, it seems to me that Mount Athos can only exist because the Greek government allows them to exist as a confessionally Orthodox island because the Greek government is a confessionally Greek Orthodox state. And you can compare that with Steubenville, right? Or let's say Steubenville became 100% like new polity supporters and the people who live there, they would not be able to actually put in like theocratic laws in Steubenville. They'd be immediately struck down by the Ohio Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court, you know, even with a very, very conservative court. And so it doesn't seem you actually could have it. And I've thought a little bit of how could you have it? Sort of my best attempt was you put in like HOAs because they can usually get away with quite a bit more than like a government could. But it still seems that you cannot actually have a confessionally Christian town in the U.S. in the way you can have in Greece. Yeah, I mean, so so the the epilogue is me giving a little bit to people who are saying, "Look, you've got to you've got to talk about you got to talk about liberalism." And I just and mm. because my next projects, and I know this is crazy, but I might as well say this now. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be three books: mm -hmm. one on the eternal law, one on the natural law, and one on the positive law. Um, and I'm gonna write them in that order. I've actually started already. Um, and so that's like, okay, what, 
you know, what's, what's going to come uh, later. Um, so I definitely want to develop it. And, you know, I got this idea in part, the Christian archipelago from Chandrakuka, this is kind of libertarian, liberal archipelago. Um, and, um, you know, so the, the thought was, you know, you can have these kind of small states with freedom of exit and, you, you know, you'll be able to do more than you can do when you have a large state. Now, the interesting thing about Athos is that, you know, like it's functioning with Islam running Greece, um, which is kind of amazing. I actually consider it providential. Um, and actually, I, I think you could probably allow for that as well, um, e easily. Um, and so the interesting thing would be whether, um, you know, who, who, who kind of is running this show. So I would say actually, you know, it survives Islam. So that's like my first response, but like, oh, that's a good point. Response, yeah. Yeah. So the, the other thing that I would say, um, is, um, <clears throat> you have had leagues, um, and I know like the conditions under which the Hanseatic League existed are like, you know, pretty different. And you had had a lot more federalism, but you have Switzerland. I mean, Switzerland's a thing. And I mean, they are still pretty, pretty decentralized. You're right. There's a larger kind of federal government. It's true. But what I've been thinking about actually is, you know, um, <laughs> having spent maybe too much time in the libertarian movement and libertarians have like so many different theories about how to get to libertarianism, it, it just shows that they don't know. And so I've applied a little bit of that to integralism uh, in chapter four. Um, and one of their ideas, <laughs> stupid, like, my goodness, you've got, someone could do a, a you know, me dancing uh, you know, <laughs> excerpt of this video. Yeah, there we go. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to destroy that. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> well, this is too much fun to be worried about it, but I guess it's a little levity. Um, so, um, <clears throat> The libertarians are trying to start a charter city off the coast of Honduras that I mentioned, Prospera. Um, I don't know how far it's going to get um, because no libertarian plan gets very far. Um, um, but I thought, you know, well, what if Catholics tried a Prospera? Now, right now, Pope Francis, unfortunately, would just stop it. Um, but I don't think that's a permanent state of affairs. Um, and so you can imagine, you know, there being a kind of Catholic charter city that kind of starts and gradually tries to kind of ramp up like they have kind of a, a plan. And so they start off just being like super conservative uh, in terms of, you know, natural law. They try to establish then maybe something like the Irish Constitution um, and then kind of build integralism and figure things out as they go. Um, and I think that that's actually not unlike what was going on in Western Europe, where people were kind of figuring out, OK, well, what's the canon law? And there's like a series of like jumps forward in the systematization of the canon law and so on. Um, and, I, you know, I, I'm, you know, the liberal in the sense that, you know, I want I, I like experiments in living. There's some I, for Christian reasons, really dislike. Um, but um, but I actually think um, a, ch a charter city of some kind off the coast of a country that uh, was likely to tolerate it, like, a, you know, a couple of Latin American countries, it's probably, I mean, it's improbable that it would work, um, but it's like way less improbable that the U.S. is going to become integralist. But for Steubenville, the problem is, yeah, they're under, they're under direct geographical state control. Um, and so I, I'm afraid it's integralism it's at sea. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. it's all silly, right? I mean, but there's mm -hmm. different degrees of, of silly. Now, I think Vermeule is just going to say, look, I mean, they're just any liberal state just going to crush any confessional city state or whatever. And I mean, maybe Athos still exists. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there are. So so I guess my thought is, um, you know, it's something that should be attempted. And if it look, I, I would use the same rationale that that, that you had that. You know, I'm not really worried about the details because Christ is king and, you know, he, he's going to he's he knows what he's going to do and he's going to do it. Um, and you think, OK, well, what is the best way to live out the gospel in my political life? Right. You you reject that because I reject the liberal privatization of religion. I just think liberalism could survive uh, getting rid of it. Um, and, um, you know, so I'm totally against like the privatization of, of religious belief in politics and so on. I mean, I've often thought, you know, like what would be what should Christians really be doing politically? They, they shouldn't be apolitical, at least not all of them. Um, and so they should be kind of involved. And I thought, OK, well, there's this kind of big state strategy. And there's like this small state kind of not in terms of it not doing much state, but like geographically small. Um, and I just thought that would probably be a little bit easier to pull off. Um, 
And so that's that's kind of what's going on in, in that chapter is I'm saying, because I actually think, you know, one of the tragedies of kind of like the, the most famous integralists, not only have they gotten away from the theory, but I'm worried they're actually going down a number of rabbit holes that are not that are actually making integralism less likely rather than more likely. Um, and um, I also you know, I, I don't I maybe get too critical, but, you know, the, the integralists, should, they need to get along with each other a little bit better and get mm-hmm. together and talk a little bit more. Um, that's all I'll say. Um, uh, and so like this, you know, you got to show, right, that like you can actually build coalitions. And so one of the tragedies of them is trying to get so far into politics and getting fights with all these different little groups is like you have to show that you can build a coalition. And mm-hmm. um, and that's going to be part, I think, of living out living out the gospels like we have to find a way to cooperate in order to bring about justice and the common good. Um, and, and so I'm worried that all this focus on, you know, day to day politics is is actually un- self undermining um, because I think I think a lot of the folks are having a lot of trouble building coalitions. Um, and I think they're, they've mm-hmm. gotten better at it um, over the last uh, particularly the last two years. They've gotten a lot better at it. Um, but yeah. um, so maybe they'll learn by doing. So anyway, that's kind of that's kind of my thought is that, like I just think the big state strategy, I think it makes a certain kind of sense. But I just think it's way way wilder than a charter city but charter charter city yeah. is still very wild i mean you know so i admit that yeah um <clears throat> yeah we could get hung up on this for but i know you said you only have like an hour and a half and i don't know if you you need to stick to that <laughs> um uh, so, i can go a little bit longer um yeah okay sure, i can sure. as well yeah I'll have to i'm spin enjoying around. this discussion yeah i have to spin around when things go dark again i think it's because like yeah. i'm not like my office and there it is you know, the light and I don't move (laughs) enough. So maybe I should just wildly gesticulate for the rest of the time we're talking. (laughs) I won't trust me. I won't do that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Something that, let's see how it goes. Yeah. See something that comes up in your book quite a bit as I think it's sometimes explicit other times sort of the (laughs) hidden premise is that we have a much stronger (laughs) sense nowadays of our individuality in a way we don't have. And I think probably in part it's due to Christianity in a very good way, you know, that, um, like there's uh, with the movements like the friars going out to the individuals and stuff versus the early approach of missionaries which you just convert the king and then you just kind of let things go out work out from there and so it's almost hard to imagine a society now that has more monolithic views on things because we have a much stronger sense of our individuality and i'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that do you think that our individualism now really prevents putting that genie back in the bottle, you know, and having a society with widely shared values. Oh man, I have so much to say about this. I'm going to try to compress it. Um, the short answer is probably. Mm-hmm. Um, the best way is to, to get there actually is like the last chapter of Nezik's book that people don't read on the, you know, utopia. It's anarchy, state, and utopia, right? And that last part doesn't get read. <laughs> So the utopia for Nozick is the utopia of utopias. Um, and so, you know, you have this kind of basically federal structure that's also kind of informing what I'm talking about. And then the people can self-sort when they agree. Um, and 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 that uh, that's a way I think of kind of trying to preserve some kind of homogeneity of purpose. But then you got to keep the, the meta level at a nice place. And, you know, someone like Vermeule or even most integralists are going to say, look, Satan's going to be in charge of that thing if we're not um, hmm. even the meta level. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting objection, but I like the idea of people being able to self-sort. And here's the reason. Um, even if we can become less individualistic, it doesn't mean we'll agree on values. So, you know, we might have a pretty collectivist ethos, but we're Soviets or we're Confucians or we're Hindu. And so the problem is you're going to get diverse, homogeneous communities. Um, and I actually think, there's a lot of really interesting um, like evolutionary, cultural evolution, biological evolutionary theory about religious disagreement. One of the most awesome books I read, uh, How Liberalism or How uh, Religion Evolved. Um, and I know, let's leave aside six day or what have mm-hmm. you. But he points out one thing that seems like you you would acknowledge like about the brain, which is that we can only have so many social connections, just neurologically. Yeah. So there's like, you know, a small group of people that we are close to, a wider group of people that we're connected to, and then a wider group of people that we know. And he thinks it's roughly on the order of like 10, 100, 1,000. 
there's neurologically, we, we have to split off into communities. And he says the one of the reasons, like basically all religions fracture and fragment. Um, and Catholicism, you know, does reasonably well at this, although it did spin off Protestantism. Sorry, that's y'all's fault. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just an orthodox joke. I had to throw one in. Um, is that, you know, you've got basically, um, because of this, there's always the potential for like ideological or theological entrepreneurship. Right. So, you, you know, you have this group, it's successful, it expands, and then all the little pieces start to break off and, and fragment, even if, you know, and he thinks Dunbar thinks this has been Robin Dunbar thinks this has been going on for tens of thousands of years. And he says that religion in general has this tendency to, to factionalize. But that, that was true long before there was anything like modern individualism. So I actually I actually think this is one of the reasons that the many of the, the great religions were able to take over is they were able to give like a full rationale, actually use some coercion um, and have some moral motivations because many of the older religions don't really have moralizing gods. So they're able to kind of take over um, given their, their theology and, and, and statecraft um, and also yeah. economy, economic stuff. I mean, Islam was very good at that. So can we get the genie back? I mean, it, you know, if, even if we don't do individualism, I think it's going to be difficult. Yeah. And I think that's definitely fair. And, you know, I often do wonder because it's hard to reach out and really talk to someone from the past of how much have things actually changed, because we only have writings from sort of a certain elite class. So, you know, you read it sometimes. Yes. You read the um, poems written by Ovid about his personal life and you feel like someone like intensely like who could just be the same sort of person alive now. Or you read like Augustine's Confessions and they really do feel like people who could be just here now, just like any of us. And I do sometimes wonder, are we also overplaying the extent to which individuality has increased in the modern world? So, so um, yes, I think it's hard to know, particularly about peasant piety in Western Europe. There are some mm -hmm. people who try to kind of to measure it, to see where it is. But, you know, I just finished this book on the counter uh, history of the Counter-Reformation or the Catholic Reform. And a huge amount of it is just like, we have to educate these peasants. Like we need to get out here and catechize these people because they don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Like they're basically paying. Yeah. Um, and so a huge amount of like pre-Reformation and also like independent of the Reformation, Catholic developments is we've got a responsibility to these people. They need to, they need to have true beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, for centuries, I mean, what is a seventh century like Provencal or Cornwall or whatever it is? I don't know if those existed then, but like, what do they actually believe? And it's really, it's really, really hard to know. Um, so I, I definitely think there's there's a point there where the elites, I think, were more religious and maybe the folk were less Christian. Whereas today, I think in the United States, it's like the reverse, like the elites are secular, but the folk are kind of more Christian than the elites. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, the elites, I think they absorb Christianity. And the key with Christianity, and this comes out most in Protestantism, is interiority. And this idea of focusing on the, the inner person and the inner person's experience. Um, and, I, you know, that long predates Protestantism. It's just Protestantism just takes that and kind of runs with it to the detriment of other stuff. Um, so it accelerates that process. Um, but I also think there's some other like weird historical forces stuff going on. So if you read Joseph Henrik's book, The Weirdest People in the World, and this is capital weird, right? Western, educated, rich, industrialized, democratic. He has this wild theory of how individualism developed in Western Europe. It's, I've just got to tell you because it's just too fascinating. Yeah. So he says, well, here's, what, here's what happened is that for most of human history, almost all of it, the, the, the traditional family is a clan. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the Catholic Church starts doing, and it, it gets even better at it once there's more separation from the East, is banning cousin marriage. And then they, he goes through all of these local councils. He's a massive source of, of canon law. And he just goes through and he's like, oh, now they've been second cousin marriage. Oh, now they've been third cousin marriage. Oh, now they've been fourth cousin marriage. Some of them got into six cousins. You can't marry your sixth cousin. What does that do to clans? It destroys them. Ruins them. And so now you've got to have something closer to the nuclear families. And then what do they do when they need to get through a cold winter? They have to have institutions, formal institutions now, formal legal structures. They can't just rely on the clan to get them through. And so Henrik's story about how individualism develops, about how um, trade develops, um, is these this again, it's it's too it's it's really a wild theory, but he backs it up with just stunning 
amount of church documents. And he's now, it's told yeah. me, he's in the process of translating the Greek sources um, to, because it, he thinks orthodoxy did something similar, but to a lesser degree, which is why he thinks Russia and so on are less individualist than, say, England. That's probably the best theory I've heard. I'm definitely going to have to look at that. You know, individualism also does have a sense of taking apart clans. You know, I've noticed this coming from a Jewish ethnic background where, you know, mm -hmm. in like my parents' generation, your story there was a very is a strong sense. Way. Like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but like in my parents' generation, you know, you have to marry a Jew. I mean, my parents don't believe like anything Judaism <laughs> teaches. They go to synagogue like once a year, you know, but you got to marry a Jew. You got to continue on the culture versus in my generation that had a complete breakdown of that. And I think it's because, you know, a my great grandparents were all Orthodox Jews. And so even though by my grandparents' generation, they weren't practicing Jews anymore, that cultural aspect begins to fall apart. That by my generation, you know, I grew up in a very Jewish area and almost none of those people I know are still very closely identified with their Jewish identity. A lot of them have gone on to marry people who aren't Jewish. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing with uh, Judaism is I actually think there's a very simple cultural evolutionary model that explains this, which is that the mm -hmm. Jews that didn't follow those norms were absorbed. They assimilated. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, so the, the folks that remain are the ones that preserve that norm no matter what. Um, and one of the interesting things about that norm, it, it makes perfect sense if you have an evolutionary story, cultural evolutionary story, which is that this is why you can be a Buddhist Jew, but you can't be a Christian Jew or a Muslim Jew. Because mm -hmm. Christianity and Islam were the ones constantly uh, uh, proselytizing, constantly harassing, oppressing, looting. Uh, and so you wanted really strong norms against assimilating into those groups. But the Eastern religions, like who cares, right? So you could have yeah. an atheist Buddhist Jew and most Jewish people are like, oh, yeah, they're still Jewish. And then my Jewish friends were like, yeah, but if you become a Christian, you're not Jewish anymore. Um, that's but, pretty much where I come from. Yeah. In that background that like, I'm sort yeah. of seen as now outside the community versus back when I was an atheist Jew, I was completely still part of the community. And it's very interesting yeah. how <laughs> I've asked my Jewish friends who, you know, I adore, I've just like, can you make sense of this for me? Like, why can you be a Buddhist Jew and not a Christian Jew? And, you know, these are some, you know, you know, wonderful, br brilliant, you know, people. And, and it's weird. There's like, they kind of don't know. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's not really a good, uh, explanation, which is another reason I think it's an evolved cultural more rather than something that was argued, something that was argued for. I'm sure, I'm sure there are arguments somewhere. I just, I never got them. I never encountered them really. Yeah. I think it is a cultural thing. So, you know, you look at somewhere like Spain, it's one of my friends has been going in a lot recently, like Spanish counter-reformation history. And it's interesting mm -hmm. until, like, down the line of like every famous person from that era and almost all the Spaniards are actually conversos from that era, like running the whole <laughs> counter-reformation there. <laughs> and, and, um, oh, yeah. But, sorry. Sorry. You've got me excited. Adopted, you know, yeah. Spanish identity and their conversion. So like, even though you go to the historical record and you see a lot of their parents or grandparents were conversives, by the time they're actually up and running things, that's not closely seen as being connected with their identity anymore. Um, yeah, so so this is this is extremely interesting because there, there's a couple of things at the Spanish case that are interesting. So first of all, and this is one of the ways integralism broke down, the Spanish Inquisition was, people don't know this, were made mostly at conversos. So, so mm -hmm. baptized Jews. It doesn't make it, it great or anything, but it's just an, an important and interesting point to understand theologically. The other thing mm -hmm. is it was run, it was approved by the Pope, but it was run by the Spanish crown. So a lot of people don't understand, like, basically, I mean, yes, yeah, Spain is like, by that time, it's not really integralist. Um, and I actually think maybe if it was, it would have been a little less terrible in South America. Um, mm -hmm. Just to, to grant my Catholic friends something. Um, but um, I, from love. Um, but, um, uh, yes. So the con conversos are the ones, you know, being tried to loop back in and what happens is they leave. And Mark Koyama, who's an economic historian who's written on persecution and toleration. He says, actually, that was a disaster for Spain. He even thinks that some of these folks were so productive and so creative that like today, Spain still suffers from having done that. Um, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's really, it was really dramatic um, that, that you chased, you chased out, you know, a group of people that were spectacularly talented, um, and, and, and paid the consequences. And again, this is something Koyama argues. I'm not just riffing on this. Um, so yeah, there's been, there's, you know, been some, some, some work on this. You really don't want to, um, uh, it's yeah, anyway. So, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, 
You know, something I've noticed is that there can be a tendency in integralist circles to want to make everything that happens in our history good. And something I've been encountering a lot is how badly run the index was. Like the index of forbidden books was entirely political, like stuff that absolutely should have ended up there in any normal world didn't end up on it versus like um, Angelo Volpez, who is probably one of the greatest SCOTUS theologians in history, ended up with his entire work on the index for basically no reason, except that he was too harsh to St. Thomas at some points in it. And basically some entirely for political reasons, it got put on the index. And so, you know, everyone's still using him. They're just not citing him anymore because he's on the index. And so I think it's very easy for us to see that something I noticed as you were going through, like, how could we have heresy blocks today in spreading stuff? And you were suggesting, um, like, maybe they could have something like the uh, Chinese sort of approach to the Internet, where things are very highly controlled by the Chinese government, even though I have been a very big promoter of integralism. I sort of recoiled even at that. And I'm saying, if I'm recoiling at that, there's no way we can get the vast majority of people on board with something like that. And it does seem that I don't really know how you could in the modern world easily have a control on the spread of heresy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's, yeah, there's a, there's a, um, a number of issues there. So the first thing I thought of when you were saying that is that Bellarmine's was almost on the index. And he's, mm-hmm. he's not just, he's not just, what, is he blessed or is he saint? He, he's a that. doctor of the church now. Well, he's also a doctor of the church, right? But that's he's, he's canon. He is a saint. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's doctor of the church. How many doctors of the church are? There's not a lot. I think 36 now, but he was one of the earlier okay. ones, you know, like yeah. the, the list has gotten kind of ridiculous now. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, so yeah, I mean, like he, it's crazy. Like his stuff was almost on there because, you know, Pope Six the fifth just had false beliefs about his, his temporal authority. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, he died before it was like, I think it was on there maybe for a little while, but not for very long. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's no doubt it's, you know, going to be politicized and this just plays into kind of standard libertarian arguments. Libertarians aren't always wrong. Um, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the kind of million stuff that, yeah, the censor is going to, you know, be corrupt. Um, now of course, um, you know, again, this is a point integralists would make. It's like, well, every society has taboos. There's always some places you can't go and it would be better than, yeah. you know, that. And um, one of the interesting points that, um, so when I wrote the, the Vermeer chapter, um, the, the one on transition and trying to unify all strategic works, um, I was looking at the picture and I was like, this is like kind of wild. And then I did a closed door session with some Christian graduate students. Um, and they were like, yeah, I mean, like, like he's probably, he's got to be wrong in some of the details, but like, the woke did it. Why can't we like, it must be possible mm-hmm. to do like, we must be able to do this. Um, and, and so, yeah, I was, I was, I was still really surprised, but I mean, look, there is a reason that, you know, that, that group of, of integralists is saying not stuff about China. You know, wasn't it, wasn't it Deneen, Amari and Papin who had the New York times place where they called China a civilizational equal. Um, Sometimes Amari will tweet stuff or Vermeule will tweet stuff that seems like kind of pro-China. I think there's a very clear reason, which is I think they understand that you need something like a Chinese administrative state to something like it to make it work. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, a lot of us recoil at that. Um, but I, th- why do they keep going back to saying nice stuff about China? Like, why does that keep happening? It just it will crop up like every couple of months. And it's like, what is going on there? That's what I think is going on. I think they understand, even though Amari's kind of declaimed you know, being exactly an integralist. The point is, um, I think they understand that, I think they believe that you wouldn't do everything China did, obviously, because haven't they like basically like aborted the population of the United States or something like that (laughs) over time? Um, So yeah, I mean, uh, it's gonna not be a great situation, but there might be maybe lighter touches or things you can do, but this is actually one of the least realistic parts of the the view because, um, you know, there are China's very special and unique country in the sense that it it's had people that were that were building the state for millennia, and people that are used to like and are terrified of there not being a state, right? Mm-hmm. Just it's just built in thousands of years. As soon as we don't have a strong center chaos death famine you know and you need you need a culture like that i think to be willing to tolerate it but particularly you and you've got all these scots irish descendants in the u.s 
And, and they're basically culturally developing in a situation where there's no state. And so they have to be kind of individualist or small family and they have to be willing to be really violent. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, this is why I think in the South, you still have a lot higher like manslaughter rates than you do in the North, because you've got this culture of, of just fighting and having to defend yourself. And this these Scots Irish people like in Appalachia and Alabama and stuff like they're not going to put up with any of this stuff. You know, I mean, just just in terms yeah. of this deep seated cultural norms. And this is precisely why in his debate with Pecknold, or maybe it was another it was his talk at New Polity. That Andrew Willard Jones was talking about like Jacksonian integralism. And it mm -hmm. was because he, I think he gets this, like that is not going away. Yeah. You know? And so, so yeah, as long as you've got these kind of cultural developments, you know, following certain groups of people, because people do bring their culture with them. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, this, this, you're going to have to engage in massive cultural reconstruction. And the, the Chinese case, it works because their state is really, really old. And there's a whole ether bureaucrat that we do not have in this country. Um, so, yeah, I think that's going to be a problem. Yeah. You know, it's I can see sort of where both sides are coming from on that. On one hand, you know, there's certain aspects of the Chinese government I really recoil at. And I really think Jones is right that this would not work in America at all. But I also yeah. think there's something on the other side where there's a strong culture war anti-China attitude in a lot of the U.S. where you can't say anything positive about China without being seen like a communist or something. Yeah, And, you know, yeah, like when yeah. they said civilizational equal, I think that's totally fair, that there is something to ah. China that they have, right? Unlike, for example, when we, right, when the uh, Catholics right, evangelized Northern Europe, Germany at this time was not a civilizational equal to Rome. So they had to no. adopt aspects of Roman law and Greek philosophy and so on versus, you know, China. They already have their own strong sense of the natural law and Confucianism. They have their own strong legal traditions in such a way that I think evangelizing them would look a lot more like evangelizing Rome than evangelizing Germany, where you have yeah. to accept hmm. their cultural aspects in a way that wouldn't work in the U.S. But um I also wanted to comment on your point of yeah. their sense of sort of ancientness, right? Because they can trace themselves yeah. back to, they have sort of this great flood myth and then a series of emperors they can trace down. If we're taking that in a Christian story, I mean, this is the most ancient civilization probably that still exists on earth as a continuous civilization. Their history goes back 4,000 years of recorded history. And so to them, you know, we're probably a small little blip in a history compared to their sense of what's going on. Um, and one of my good friends is, um, he lives in Malaysia, but he's Chinese. And there's a str much stronger sense of cultural duty and anti-individualism that he has that we almost could not grasp when we were at college with him. Because, you know, he wanted to be a priest, but his parents said, no, you got to work in business for five years and make sure you're well established before you enter seminary. And he just obeys that. We're like, you're 22. Like, you should be able to make your own life decisions and do what you want. <laughs> but in his mind, it doesn't matter how old you are. You obey your parents no matter what. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think that's really important. And I do think, you know, when Jesus is teaching us, mm -hmm. he's saying that, that the faith comes first. Yeah. Right? And, you know, you know, he puts it in a kind of, I don't know how you read, but kind of sort of hy hyperbole in a way, I think, yeah. um, hating your father and mother or what have you. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it's tough um, um, because, you know, I was listening, I was at um, a think tank and you had, um, you know, Bishop Barron who came and gave a talk and, um, and, you know, he was talking about like Christianity versus individualism and, you know, and I was uh, and, and autonomy and all this stuff. And my thought is like, actually, the faith kind of contains within it. Like the problem isn't so much like freedom, interiority, like conscience, the convictions of conscience. The problem is, you know, just like taking that out and making it the entirety. Right. Yeah. So so, you know, Christianity is always trying. Um, and this is, you know, it's true. Like many of the heretics are tr trying to reduce, you know, get rid of a mystery, reduce it to one side of that tension um and so yeah i think christianity just comes like has individualist elements has collective communitarian elements and i think that's really cool because i think it's true um like true morality has got to be a mix of these things um but uh, yeah so i mean yeah it's it's gonna be tough to have the kind of administrative state that you need so like just briefly for the 
the way I set it mm-hmm. up is a, in chapter four is a dilemma, which what I call moral feasibility. So I say, like, you can get to integralism, but you're going to have to violate Catholic moral teachings to do it in any society like ours, or you just you can't get to it. So what I don't do is the standard argument and say, oh, it's unrealistic. Like it is, but like that's a lot less interesting than, well, let's imagine how it might even go. And can you actually can you actually get there um, again, respecting the relevant constraints? Because, you know, Vermeule says even in the Christian strategy, piece, he's like, yeah, I mean, Paul brandishes his citizenship. I think this is the right one. It may be another one because there's like 13 mm-hmm. of these things um, where um, he never lies. And I'm thinking, OK, so he thinks you could get there, but also maintain like the highest moral standards. And so then I had this like weird thought, which I only indicated, which I, was, I spent like an afternoon trying to draw up a just integration theory. Mm-hmm. that would be on analogy instead of between countries of just war theory, it'd be like this theory of just war applied to co-opting the state. Um, and yeah, once I started to set out the principles and their degree of priority, it was just really hard to imagine. Because like, there's this book that I referenced some in there, The Politics of Ideocracy, not idiocracy, but I-D-E-O-cracy, like an ideological state. Um, and he, he, they, they got a common model between communist fascists and the uh, Iranians. The, the, and, and they make a couple of remarks about like, well, how, how do you actually like ideologically colonize a, a modern state? And there's a bunch of things they think are necessary. So for one, you need like ultra loyal shock troops that can basically terrorize the military into obedience. So why you SS, brown shirts, Mujahideen, um, you know, <clears throat> there's all these conditions to like completely re-evangelize a people, which the Bolsheviks did. I mean, you know, they were, they're fairly successful in wiping out Russian Christianity, um, you know, which is, you know, a hideous crime and, and, and a, a terror. But the point was that, you know, they were able to do it, but, boy, they had to do some of the worst stuff anybody's ever done to do that. Um, I mean, just some of the most wicked and evil horrors that any human being has ever done. I mean, so, you know, it's just really hard to see how you maintain a Catholic moral standard. You have to think that history is going to solve the problem for you. And I think what's, you know, third generation integralists are going to find is that they need a vanguard. And so, you know, I kind of jokingly call integration from within Thomism and Leninism. Um, because, you know, it's going to ultimately have to be led by a vanguard of people because the American people aren't going to rise up for that. Um, so, you know, eventually there'll be frustration. The working classes don't revolt against the liberal elites or the working classes don't revolt against the capitalist class. So they need people that really understand them in order to lead them. Hence Deneen's Aristopopulism, um, which I think is integralism light. And he calls the last chapter integration because he's winking at his, his readers, um, that he's kind of on board now. Um, which, you know, he changes his mind. I'm not attacking him for that. Um, and yeah, I think the thought is there needs to be some kind of like elite integration with like, with like the, the working classes. And this is how they see like the direction the Republican party needs to go in. Although I think they're now despairing of this because of what Amari has been saying about the GOP with his new book. So yeah, I think they're going to run into this issue of, well, look, you're going to end up having to have you know, elites playing a really, really strong role and just kind of dragging the people along. Because a lot of Vermeule's stuff about predicting the fall of liberalism is really just, um, well, it's a lot like with Marx and the falling rate of profit. So, you know, all the capitalists, they find the profit opportunities, but the, the diminishing returns to profit get, you know, kick in. And so there's less and less prof- profit. The capitalist class gets more and more desperate. Well, Vermeule has an analogy with liberalism. Liberalism is focused on these kind of uh, liberations. And the way I put it in the book is like, there's a kind of diminishing return to liberations. And so your liberations gets like wilder and crazier and crazier. Like you go from slavery to, you know, maybe transgender stuff. Um, and, you know, I think what Vermeule says is like, eventually they're going to run out of, people are going to s- stop tolerating just being bossed around and being told that they're backward. Like they're just not going to tolerate it forever um, because it's just going to get too crazy. Um, and I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's true. Um, but I think at some point it looks a lot like Marxism predicting that the workers will rise up, that capitalism will fall. And then, in fact, what happens is um, you have to have this elite led thing and you have to be super, super horrible to people to get it to get it done, unfortunately. Yeah. See, my thought in terms of how you integrate from within is a larger integration to the whole of society. So I think sort of the approach that's needed is sort of what any Christian would want to do, which is evangelism, right? So you would want to approach the evangelism of the country. And I also think 
that the renewal of the social order that Leo the Thirteenth suggests in Immortale Day in Rerum Novarum can't yeah. be entirely separated from his renewal of the intellectual life in Eternity Patris. Oh, very and nice. Yeah. So I think a big part of this also is a re-education and not just in, you know, I was talking about this um, a few days ago with someone, they were saying, oh, well, you know, we used to have the vast majority of the U.S. had Catholic schools and even lots of non-Catholics went to Catholic schools. But to me, those Catholic schools were essentially like public schools where you also got a religion class. And there's a very much different approach where you're also teaching a sort of whole metaphysical synthesis of all of the natural sciences that you got in something like the Middle Ages or the early modern period that needs to be done in a actually much deeper approach of a whole Catholic worldview that's being given. Um, you know, this is where I think that a lot of the classical natural law stuff is sort of dead on arrival, is that no one actually believes the metaphysics anymore, except for a small group of intellectuals, and that's not going to change unless you have in a world of mass education, mass education and metaphysics as well. And I'm still trying to think about what that looks like because that could easily go very badly. Um, yeah, and so it seems to me yeah, you need yeah. a much deeper sort of restructuring of the society that has to happen. And then to me, the changing of the political order is sort of the last thing that happens. Maybe not the last thing, but significantly down the line. You know, it's like in Rome, like I think something that was captured like 10% of the empire was when Constantine came about. But even Constantine, all he did is legalize Christianity and sort of slightly promote it. And it took till the empire was majority Catholic in the realm of the time of Theodosius to actually change the empire. And I don't think something could happen like that in America. Like with our constitutional order, I could easily see you evangelize, let's say, enough of the country that you could pass an amendment making America a Catholic country or something like that and add that to the Constitution. I think historically, with the way things are going in America, that probably won't, we probably will end up with a breakdown of the constitutional order before that. But um, sort of in theory, you know, if we wanted to uphold the best of the American system while also allowing an integration, that would seem to me to be the best way to go about it. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Oh yeah. I have a lot of thoughts on this. So, um, um, so I've taught, I mean, I, I, I haven't talked to all the, what I call the strategists, the people most politically connected. I mean, we've talked a little on talked to actually a good bit on uh, Twitter in 2019, 2020. Um, and, but I have talked to the theorists, the people that work on the pure theory. I've talked to, to pink a lot. I've talked a, a bit to father, father crane and, uh, father Walsheen and, um, um, uh, and, and Alan Femister. Um, and they all say, look, if the underlying culture isn't, there it is, third time's the charm. Um, so if that, if we don't have a Catholic culture, it doesn't really matter about all this mm -hmm. stuff about integralism. And the reason that they talk about integralism, they told me, is because we're trying to renew the church. And their view is like the reason that Western European Catholicism collapsed is that the church didn't conceive of itself as a polity. And so it wouldn't punish anybody for anything. It just wouldn't hold people accountable. Um, and I think for the, the, the theorists, that's a really a big part of it. And, and, you know, Pink yeah. is playing a pretty serious long game with church renewal. So like, what is he writing on now? He's writing a lot less on integralism, a lot more on how you can piously criticize a Pope. He's been extremely, a number of very careful pieces because he's mm -hmm. focused on the church side, right? Yeah. And and I think, you know, so so that's I think that's actually in a, a certain way, a certain way more fruitful. But I think, you know, throughout because because Pink was working on integralism in the 2000s. Um, and but, you know, he's seen with the with Francis's pontificate, um, <clears throat> you know, very important to try to figure out, well, the trads are kind of getting too nasty, but we want to be pious. But how do, how do we do it? And this is one of the most interesting contrasts with with Vermeule is that that part of the movement, Papin and so on, they won't criticize Francis at all. Yeah. They won't criticize him at all. And um, and in fact, will block people who who they think do it too much. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's another kind of I mean, I understand why my, my pet theory about why they do that is almost 100 years ago was when Pius XI condemned Oxyon Francais. Um 
and they don't want to get condemned. So they <laughs> think they, they think by never criticizing. That's partly strategic. But I also think one of the reasons that integralism got off the ground was people like Father Waldstein were like, look, the trads are too oppositional to the hierarchy. Like they're right about a lot of things. So a lot of integralist sort of piety internally over the last 10 years has really been about like we really need to obey and uphold our leaders. So I think it's both yeah. pious but also strategic. But Pink was not really part of this. So he's he, but his program, it's it's just all about renewing the church. He's debating people about theology. And so they all say, yeah, we've got to fix the church before we can do any of this. Um, so I think the strategists, although they tend to believe very elite led theories of social change. So something a little bit like what you sketch, but to a much greater degree. So if you read, say, Vermeule's like common good constitutionalism article in the Atlantic, I mean, that's pretty, pretty clear. Um, so they just have like this sort of elite led theory of social change. But I think that the theorists who also happen to all, all live outside the U.S. Um, um, and the strategists all lived in the U.S. until um, Papen moved to Hungary. Um, so it was this weird like geographical difference that I think was maybe affecting what they were focused on. But regardless, um, the, yeah, the theorists all say, look, we have to have church renewal and this stuff isn't really going to work. We can maybe push the state in some ways to be less. Um, poisonous. Um, and then that we sh that's, that's something we should do. And of course we all should also always fight for natural law, but really our focus has to be, um, our, our focus really has to be on, on reforming the church. So, yeah. And I guess I would probably agree that yeah, entirely with the theorists there. Cause to me, you know, part of the interest of integralism is recapturing that the church is not just another sort of social club among many others, but it's actually sort of God's institution on church to transform the world. And so, you know, to me, it's something I've written a little bit about. I'd like to sort of develop more is how evangelism is almost an act of integralism because it's an attempt to try and change the structure of the society. Um, you know, a lot of my own work outside of it, ether related to integralism has really been in two areas, which is to, revive discussion of the doctrine of creation because i think sort of darwinism has stopped mm. us from having being able whether you agree with darwin or not has stopped us from being able to have an intellectual discussion about that doctrine and um sort of the other area has been intellectual renewal wanting to create better actually resources for homeschoolers because i think the catholic homeschool world is run by americanists who um and, and catholic liberals essentially including the ones who go to latin mass they're all basically caught up in liberalism entirely and there isn't a much more catholic approach i think to education so this is something i discovered um trying as much to be as vague as possible here just in case people who i know watch this and will know who i'm talking about that i had a case of a mother i know is homeschooling who would be very very concerned to the end about her child not being vaccinated about COVID. But when her son said, oh, I have, I think a religious vocation of the priesthood would really discourage that because that's not a good sort of American approach. And I think this is connected to a lot of people who are in the trad world in America are extremely individualist and are extremely um, really caught up in the American culture war. And I think possibly what you're saying of people being in Europe, that's a very good point that, um, you know, I've been able to have on the doctrine of creation a much better discussion a lot with European theologians um, oh. because a lot of them aren't caught up immediately in the American culture wars about like teaching creationism or intelligent design in schools that happened in the early 2000s in the U.S. Yeah, that's I mean, that's 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 extremely interesting. Um, this reminds me of I was presenting um chapter five to what I regard as the best Catholic game theorist in the world. Um, um, and um, I won't, I won't name him, but, um, and he, uh, his wife is, is, is Latin mass. And he was like, I try to imagine these people ruling and they can't even get along in a single parish. Like, how is this possible? Oh, that's true. <laughs> you know? And, and, and I mean, he, he's a nice guy uh, uh, and, and <laughs> actually in brilliant. Um, but um, shockingly, um, but yeah, I thought this was a point, but now that you say this, I mean, maybe the Latin mass folks aren't as fractious in, in other, other places, but in the U S yeah, they, they've imbibed individualism and it gets to them because they think they've transcended it. Um, yeah. so yeah, I think, I think that's true. And, and, and let me add, <clears throat> but let me add something to this as well. <clears throat> a lot of my work on trust and polarization before I, I started down the, the road I'm on now, um, was a lot of it, it was, and I, I didn't write on this much about liberating the church. 
And that one of the reasons I wanted to sort of try to treat integrals fairly was that like, yeah, I mean, we'll, we're going to disagree about a lot of things politically, but like ultimately, what are we going to leave behind? And what we have to leave behind, I think, is we have to leave behind a community, intellectual community of people doing political theology and iron sharpening iron, because we have to re be willing to rethink our politics to liberate us from the culture war. And that's why, you know, I, that's why like my friends, you know, particularly my secular friends, like, why are you talking to these monstrous fascists? And I'm like, you know, look, a lot of people can be mistaken. Y'all don't think God exists. They're integralists. Like, you're way more confused than they are. Hmm. Um, <laughs> hmm. um, and, um, you know, our friend, you know, folks I know who are Marxists, I'm like, you, you are off, you know. So, um, so, so the reason I wanted to talk to integralists is because what they have done, and I will give them all credit for this, is that they're the beginning of this kind of liberation um, of, of young people saying, okay, we, we need to not be left versus right. And this is why I actually think it's interesting that Amari's tried to do this like social Democrat pivot. Um, it'll be interesting to see if it, it works, but it's, it's interesting anyway, that they're really trying to form the sort of social conservative, economic progressive quadrant. And even though that's not, I'm, 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 you know, catty corner to them, um, sort of, um, uh, um, they, um, in the political compass, uh, they're some of the only people that are really breaking people out of red versus blue. Um, and again, like I disagree with them stridently on like a temporary American politics, but, and I, I don't like the way they're breaking people out either, but they are, I mean, isn't that remarkable? Mm -hmm. I mean, who else yeah. is really doing it? Who else is really doing that? Libertarians used to be good at that. We're terrible at it now. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the most fascinating things floating around as a big phrase around the internet like two years ago or so, and it still pops up occasionally, was uh, Medicare for all, abortion for none. Yeah, yeah. And I thought yeah. that was one of the things of like, are you going to yeah. make everyone angry in the room? But it's a great sort of phrase to shake people up. Um, yes, yes. But we have to be, be we have to be better than slogans, right? I, I mean, this, yeah. is, this is why, I mean, I'm trying to, you know, with, with this book, that it's working at two levels. And I, I could sort of say, say this now. Because I think your your listeners will find this of interest. On the one hand, I want to address integralism and other religious anti-liberalisms to sort of say, well, what's what's good about them, what's bad about them. The other thing I cared about is developing a method of assessing political theologies. Because if when you think about the things you need to know, like nobody knows enough to do it, including me. I had to spend three mm. years just reading like all the time to even to even master the different areas of being able to not just say stupid stuff about the canon law. You know, like, for instance, in integralism, the church does not, the state does not enforce canon law. That's irrigation. They, they use the civil code to support the canon law, but you have to be careful. You can't, you, so, <clears throat> you know, there's all of these little intricacies. Um, and so what ends up coming out of the book is like, well, okay, like, here's how economic history is relevant. Here's how formal modeling is relevant to social sciences. Like, here's how the history of the church, here's when scripture matters, um, you know, and, and just trying to lay that out and say, okay, well, you know, if someone wants to disagree with me, um, and I'm really hoping uh, Pink right now is finishing up a new edition of Ho the Hobbes Bishop Bramwell debate, which is going to be awesome. I'm really yeah. excited about it. But I'm I've been encouraging him to bring together his integralism essays into an edited volume, and other people have too, um, <clears throat> to sort of sort of get this dialogue going because I care more about like we're all Christians, and particularly we're too apt. I mean. I get in trouble for Orthodox saying this, but, you know, particularly Catholics and Orthodox, like we're two apostolic churches with the sacraments. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think I'm allowed to say that as Orthodox, even if it's mm -hmm. unpopular to say, I think I'm allowed to say it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, we have the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. um, we're bound, even if we're, you know, we're estranged at the moment. Um, and so we have to free ourselves from, from these secularizing forces on the left and the right and learn to think for ourselves. And, you know, Orthodox have a long way to go. We can learn a lot from Catholics um, and also both what not to do and what to do. Um, and you find a lot of Orthodox are less caught up uh, in a lot of this uh, as well, though largely for cultural reasons that have their own drawbacks. So the goal, the ultimate goal, the ultimate point is to try to start this political converse, this political theology conversation, to create that conversation, to bring everybody in um, so that we can figure a way out of this this like mass psych psychological mess that we're in. I mean, it's not just people having bad views. Like I even think, cause I'm working on some projects on trust and polarization right now at the social scientific level um, with, with a group at the university of Pennsylvania. And um, 
And, you know, this is a this is like a mass illusion. Like a lot of the polarization exists because people have false beliefs about the others. Um, and so it, it's amazing. So, like, for instance, most Democrats thinking most Republicans are rich. And I think I think Republicans think about like a quarter of Democrats are LGBT. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, um, so, but there's just so many false beliefs. Um, and you can take people out and put them in these little like sessions where they kind of talk to each other. But like my view about this, as soon as you stick them back in their cultures, they're just going to revert and the effects don't last very long. We have to do something radical, right? I mean, we have to do something. Yeah, sorry. That is true. Now, my parents, you know, are very sort of mainline Democrats. And they were out here visiting last week and I was talking about politics. some with my dad. And it almost feels like he's living in a different reality than I am when we're talking yeah. about politics because there's just so much, many assumptions, you know, and I think it's probably also a generational divide um, yeah. because yeah. there is, you know, I think, you know, if I mention if you're a young conservative, I think you see in a very real way the breakdown of the family and the breakdown of traditional values and the way that if you're from sort of the baby boomer generation, you don't like to yeah. my parents, you know, it's all right. There was gay marriage, and now another group gets to live as ordinary families just as we do, rather yeah. than I think how a lot of young people are seeing it, which is there is a very real breakdown of sexual morals in a way, that yeah. there is a breakdown of the family <laughs> structure that's very real. Um, and, and what's striking is um, the, the younger people have suffered the negative consequences of it, whereas yeah. the older people were the ones doing it. Um, yeah. and, and so I think that's why there's, you know, a lot of younger people are interested in these kind of anti-liberalisms on the right is they're like, look, something was rotten to the core for us to get to this point. Mm -hmm. Something, something went wrong and it was horrible. And maybe Pat Deneen has the story, right? I'm not, he has the story wrong, but nonetheless, that's why I think they're, they're gravitating to these ideas is like, look, something was poisoned. We got poisoned, right? <laughs> That's definitely true. You know, in my own life, because growing up in a democratic family, I initially moved much further to the left and much further non-religious than my parents, because I initially was an atheist and sort of a big Bernie bro. And that was where I had my political awakening was sort of around the time of the Bernie campaign. By the end of that, I ended up converting to Christianity. Um, but like in that whole movement, I think you see there was something and I've encountered a lot of young traditionalists who have the same background as I did. They were from a secular family. Um, we're big Bernie supporters in 2016 and are now like staunch conservative traditional Catholics. And I think you're going to see more and more of that happening. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And I think another thing that has, there's two other things that are watering that ground. And I think it's, you know, useful to listeners to bring this up because it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, number one is that uh, Catholics intellectually in terms of their influence, particularly on the right, are at a stronger point than they've ever been in American history. So, I mean, Catholic intellectual institutions are a mess, but like, I mean, in the, the you know, but nonetheless, I mean, it, it's extraordinary to have five Catholic Supreme Court justices, a Catholic president, and until recently, a Catholic speaker of the house. Like you told someone that a hundred years ago, it would be completely unimaginable. And so to mm -hmm. some extent, the way that Catholic intellectual currents go can really have downstream effects on like the whole conservative movement in terms of, you know, what's in the Overton window and, and what isn't. Um, so, so <clears throat> that's one reason I think, you know, if you see more traditionalists at the top, you're going to see more filter down. Um, but here's something I think, um, that is not fully appreciated, which is the role of analytic philosophy of religion and apologetics in breaking down people being embarrassed for being religious in elite circles. So, you know, I run a group of about the private group of about 600 analytic theists. Um, and, um, <clears throat> they're amazing. I mean, they're the smartest people out there thinking about this stuff. I mean, we're the kind of mathematics they're applying to arguments for God's existence, you know, stuff with infinities, you know, what they're doing with Bayesianism. I mean, it, it, it's incredible. And all like 10 years, a lot of them are like 10 years younger than me. Um, and it, it's it's just it, these are people that grew up with like the they tell me there's like, yeah, we grew up with the YouTube wars of the new atheists and the theists just kept winning. And it's kind of widely regarded that the theists kind of ended up winning. So these younger people are growing mm -hmm. up just watching theists refute atheists. When I was growing up, I never saw that. I read Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time and was like, oh, yeah, the universe didn't need a beginning. And then I was introduced to Aquinas and like Stephen Hawking has no idea what he's talking about. But it took me years to learn that, like five years to learn that. 
Whereas now if someone could figure it out in five seconds. And I had the same thing, you know, I think I came around the internet right as things were shifting. Cause I was there in the early days, the big YouTube channel, Inspiring Philosophy that did a really good job popularizing a lot of the analytic arguments. And I read, um, I was interested in history. So I read some Bart Ehrman books about early Christianity. And he mentions, I debate these Christians about the resurrection. And I go, wait, you can have a debate about like whether religion is true or not. Like I've never heard of this. And I go and I watch his debate with William Lane Craig. And he William lost. Lane Craig in like five seconds <laughs> demolishes his whole argument by bringing up Bayesian analysis. <laughs> and I had never thought you could try and mathematically uh, calculate sort of an approach to the resurrection. It's interesting sort of my turn from there because I've moved away from that much more to a very classical metaphysical approach where I now become very skeptical whenever the statistics start coming out because I love mathematics, but I'm very skeptical of sort of statistical modeling. And this is where, you know, I wanted to get into a, another discussion with you about, which is in chapter five, and so ah, some yes. of my favorite pages of your book, which is the formal model of stability. And I yeah. thought this was incredibly creative where you come up with like a mathematical way to calculate whether or not there would be enough, there would be a high enough grace rate. And that's what you refer to it as, I think at one point in society in order for integralism to succeed and just show, do you mind if I show a few pages of your book here? No, no, no. I'm glad you like these pages. I, I, I thought I was going to get made fun of. Maybe I still will be, but um, uh, I, I might yeah, write mind. a parody of it, but I also like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, just to warn you, I, I do have a parody somewhat planned of it. <laughs> um, yeah. You yeah, know, you have yeah. here like y axis, x axis, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. the line of it, y2 equals the square root of grace yeah, times yeah, x yeah. minus yeah. the uh, pluralism times yeah. x squared. And then you get a few different graphic models throughout these yeah. pages. Yes, yes. And, no, um, no. It's Yeah. I've had people tell me to take it out and I'm like, I'm going to defy you. So let me ex let me <laughs> explain why I do it that way, because I actually think I have yeah. a pretty good. I think I have a pretty good rationale. So what integralists do is that the collective commitments of their theology commit them to a doctrine of stability, particularly a doctrine mm -hmm. of stability where most of social order comes from people's own grasp and acting from the natural law. And mm -hmm. what you have to kind of figure out is, OK, well, what do they mean by stability? Like, what is this kind of moral stability? Um, and this is a claim, you know, essentially you can understand in terms of like an equilibrium analysis. Um, uh, so long as you recognize there isn't just one equilibrium, like you could shock the system and it could end up with, say, a different policy configuration or whatever. So one reason for the graphs was precisely to show that you didn't need one equilibrium, that it would be a, a set of equilibria that you could move around within. So the, that's one reason for the graphs. But the, the deeper reason is this, integrals make a qualitative prediction, okay, mm -hmm. about what happens to the mere natural law state, right? But one of the best ways that I've learned in kind of analytic philosophy, politics, and economics to test a qualitative claim like that is to convert it into a quantitative claim and then try to see what the parameters are under which it would be true. And if it turns out it's true under many parameters, that's a pretty good reason to think it's it's true. And if it turns out to be true in a small number of parameters, that's a good reason to think that it's false. So the only reason I'm parameterizing things and the only reason I'm coming up with particular numbers or particular equations is that I'm trying to represent qualitative claims as quantitative claims to get a grip on the qualitative claim. The numbers are irrelevant, right? And the shape of the curve mm -hmm. was mostly to show that there's diminishing returns to coercion. Um, and because I think that's important, like the, the early like fees and stuff that you do are going to work a lot better than when you get to like executing heretics and stuff. So, you know, so first the graphs were to, to give integralist credit to say, yeah, you don't always have to return to the same, the same policy balance. Like you could move around a bunch and, and B, um, to, to just show that yeah, sometimes you need a formal model to get clear on the qualitative claim, even if the quantities don't matter. Right. So yeah. I, I had people say, take it out. And I'm like, no, people can skip that section. And I'm welcome for it to be like, I'm happy for people to be like, oh, yeah, this guy put graphs in an integralism book. And I'm like, oh, well, go look at these graphs and laugh. I'm like, yeah, buy my book, you know, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> do your parody, you know. Um, <laughs> um, but just so people just so people understand um, it, that's why I did it. Um, and what would be amazing, actually, now that the G Cat GPT has code interpreter, is now I could make the model dynamic, and I could do I could because I'm not a good programmer, and so I could do some agent, so what I call agent-based modeling of this, um, and and some smart integralist programmer kid could just like completely blow up what I did by mm -hmm. by making this into a dynamic model, um, and that's fine with me. That would be amazing, like if somebody did that. Like I would I would be ecstatic. Mm -hmm. 
you know, because a lot more we learn. So it, it was making me think you know, that was the passage that probably made me think the most through like the whole day after I read that. And I was thinking, I was like, you know, we have all these people doing like detailed economic models as advice for the government of like what we should do, not necessarily saying what you should do even, but what will happen so the government can prepare properly. And I do wonder in an integralist state, would you have to factor in things like religiosity and grace in those models, just simply given that we now have those sorts of tools, but because one concern I have is you see a strong sense within the sort of Aristotelian classical tradition to shy away from mathematical models. So they really like mathematical analogies, right? So Aristotle, when he's discussing commutative versus distributive justice, really likes this arithmetic analogy mean, of arithmetic mean. and geometric proportions. But he sort of shies away from and really says outright, you can't expect mathematical proofs in politics. He has an opening, he has a line about that in the Nicomachean Ethics. And so I'm wondering, can you, how far can you take these, right? Because you use that phrase at one point, grace rate, in one of the um, yep, footnotes. Yep, 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 and I'm sort of yep. wondering, well, we put grace in a qualitative way, and I'm not sure you can take qualitative statements and turn them into quantitative statements so easily. Yeah, to, 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 to just to, to, to test them. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is that when you ask what the qualitative claim is true or false, mm -hmm. the question is, how do you determine that? And it also raises the question about uh, the magnitudes, right? So what mm -hmm. happens? Oh, oh, the mere natural law state is going to collapse in a hundred years, thousand. How much will it collapse? What into? What are the? So mm -hmm. if the magnitudes are really small, why would we pay the price of going to integralism if we're only going to get a, a, a slight improvement, right? So if, if you stay qualitative, you don't have any sense for magnitudes. And magnitudes mm -hmm. tell us a huge amount about whether this is worth doing because you got to pay all these transition costs and you're going to get a slightly more stable state or what What if the returns are huge, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think, you know, I'm not applying any numbers that I think actually correspond to reality. I'm just trying to demonstrate how you would even evaluate the qualitative claim in a way that was interesting and tendentious rather than just, you know, fist pounding. Oh, man. Yeah, <laughs> I think that would shake my camera. So, 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 so I'm happy. I'm perfectly happy. And part I left it in, hoping that people would say, "Oh, this is a ridiculous way to approach this." And then I could be like, "But no, it isn't." Um, and so, yeah. you know, so I'm I'm eager. Like, if people start posting that on Twitter and like, "Ha ha, what a fool!" I'll just pop in and be like, "Hey, actually, I'm a pretty affable guy. Um, let's talk about this or like Zoom or something. Let's go." Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, because. You know, my first thought was, this is ridiculous. And then I kept trying to think all day, how do I refute it? And I'm like, this is actually a lot harder to refute than it looks like it is. It's like the ontological argument. You know, you read it at first, and you think <laughs> it's the silliest argument for God. And then yeah. you realize that, like, there's never actually been, like, at least in my opinion, a good reputation of it. And yeah. so, um, you know, it's gotten me thinking quite a bit of how you can model it. My, I might write up a parody at some point where I just throw in way more functions until it becomes, like, unreadable. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, you have to. Um, um, I actually have a student of mine who I, I won't name, who 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 majored in philosophy and math and minored in Greek in um, at University of Chicago and mm -hmm. still had almost a four point oh. Um, and yeah, I've talked to him. He it's ridiculous what could be done. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I tried to do the simplest model that I could for the reasons that I I stated. Um, but yeah, you can you can you can get crazier with it. But the the. the but think about it like this. What is like the integral is like pretty much favorite word besides like use. Um, mm -hmm. It is order. Right. Order, 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 order. Right. What do they mean by an order? Do they tell us what they mean by an order? I mean, they talk about things being ordered to a final end, but that's more like an aim than it is a, a system level description. I mean, it can, you can have a system level description where the system has a direction. I mean, you could talk about that. Mm -hmm. but, um, but in terms of talking, well, is this an order? And then what's a disorder? And what does it mean for it to be an order? And so I'm thinking, okay, look, we're just going to introduce some really simple equilibrium analysis. And here's the truth. Pink has some rational choice background. Vermeule was an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. Okay. He has, he, so I wrote this in part because I think the two of them, they know what I'm trying, they will know immediately what I'm trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think Pink will engage. I don't think Vermeule will engage, but um, I think they'll both know. Um, and I wrote this in part to try to sort of reach out to the, the leading lights of the movement and say, look, I'm taking you, I'm taking you very seriously. So, yeah, yeah. I wanted to, to do some rational choice modeling um, just to see kind of how it would 
how it would go. And I mean, look, I had an economist read this and he's like, well, why don't you solve this dynamically? And I'm like, do you know who my readers are? <laughs> you know, like, like, I can't do that. I even have a section in there because Pink was like, yeah, you're not going to be able to apply. Uh, we were in Chicago. And he says, like, um, he says, you're not going to be able to apply rational choice theory to the theory of the church. And I'm like, okay, I'll think about that. So I have like the, the like the subsection that's like theology and economics, an incongruous method. And I say, particularly once you have sin in the model, like the the homo economicus, like people being self interested, will apply to a portion of human behavior, mm -hmm. not all of it, right? And it, it's 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 predictive in a lot of contexts. Mm -hmm. um, we are sometimes, you know, um, and so so I mean, again, once sin's in the model, and people really, you know, I mean, you can. You can actually model any choices of utility function if you want to. I mean, if you want to get into the philosophy of economics of it, but setting that aside, um, yeah, I mean, look, as, as soon as there as soon as there's sin in the model, I actually think this this kind of analysis applies because you've got some people that are trying, you know, to to pursue in the best instrumental means to their ends, and their ends are, you know, just their own benefit. Um, so that's another kind of defense of, uh, of using the analysis because of the character of the integralist ideal. And, you know, one of the ways I got I got into this is I was reading John Courtney Murray, because when he's trying to blow up the concept of the thesis, one of the things he says is, well, wait, there are like different ways in which a Catholic society could be pious. Right. And he's like, well, oh, wait, is the is the thesis like where most people are believers? Does it matter like how committed they are? And then he just says, we're done with the thesis. And my response is, we haven't even begun. Like Murray yeah. was totally like Murray was totally wrong. He was totally wrong to say, "Oh, yep, I raised some little problems for that idea of the thesis." Let's and, and then he even says, "Let us now abolish the thesis hypothesis distinction from from Catholic theology or however he puts it." And you know he barely tried. Now it's true that his predecessors weren't very careful, but you know because I had a little PPE background, I'm I, I'm friends with I think the best modeler of my former modeler of my entire generation. Um, although he thinks it's crazy, I'm writing on integralism, so I won't I won't name him. Um, but, um, you know, so, so, so I thought I would try to, you know, I'm actually in a way trying to help the integralist with the formal analysis. You know, one is, yeah. you know, you know, so trying to figure out when it would be true and not, and not true. So anyway, that's my defense of the, the graphs. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is an interesting thing to think about because my immediate response, well, in some sense, grace is on a qualitatively different order than nature. But if we accept simply that and put that into a mathematical model, that should mean even the smallest amount of grace given should completely remove any sort of issues within a political system. And that can't possibly be right. Nope. Exactly. Um, See, this is why I wrote the book, man, is because this is what we're doing in political theology is you're like, oh yeah, grace, if it's like the magnitude, this is what I want people to be thinking. This is why I wrote the book is to yeah. people to be like, oh man, you're asking a new question, you know? And that's, look, if, if the graphs did that, they they serve their purpose. Yeah, and there's another spot where you have where you're discussing marginal um, value theory. And it's something interesting yes, I've yeah, been thinking yeah. about, right? Because obviously considered in itself, the Eucharist is infinitely more valuable than yes. any earthly good. But you make the point of that there's a certain point at which anyone, right, is going to be willing to miss a daily mass in order to do something else that's very important. Yes. Right. Yes. And there's going to be something yeah. of importance. And everyone notices this because there's very few people who actually go to daily mass without any exceptions ever. Right. And even if you yeah. did, then you could go down the line with other sorts of things related to the church. And strictly speaking, you know, the, in the Eucharist is going to be infinitely more valuable because it has an infinite essence to it versus any other possible thing has a finite essence to it. But you make that point of that. And I was thinking, all right, these are actually, I think, much more difficult things to wrestle with and something I'd like to think about more because I think the other approach, as I was saying, is push it away. But then I was thinking that's not how we approached the introduction of the new learning in the medieval universities. The best people went and dealt with the new Aristotelian learning that came in. And in some sense, we're going to have to. And I think, unfortunately, part of even though these second scholastics, people like Suarez and um, Bellarine, people Vittoria are- Vittoria at some point, by the way. Yeah, yeah Vittoria. Um, I was trying to think of some of the SCOTUS, like Frosten and stuff. These were great, brilliant people, but almost all of them were extremely afraid of the new learning and basically almost refused to engage it. Um, and they sort of take pot shots at it oftentimes. Um, in a way, I think that that was This is was why Bellarine was after Galileo. Oh, I hadn't put yeah. that together. 
Yeah, because uh, oh, have you read their letters back and forth? No, no, I haven't. Well, you need Is to, it awesome? It's really interesting because Bellarmine's actually a lot smarter in his objections than you'd expect him to be. Where oh, he's yeah. essentially sort of predicting oh, yeah. relativity theory as a response to Galileo. Uh, you know, they're not writing them directly to each other. They're sort of writing them each to other people, but these are public letters, obviously in intention to each other. So let me add something uh, to this. Okay. The yeah. only person in Hobbes's Leviathan that he mentions by name and detail at all mm -hmm. is Bellarmine. And the longest yeah. chapter in Leviathan is the one that nobody reads, chapter 42 of Ecclesiastical Polity. He says, look, Bellarmine makes the best case for the Catholic side. This is the monster of Malmesbury that we're talking about. He's mean to everyone. He's an old crab, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and he says this about Bellarmine. And I'm like, why is Hobbes being nice to Bellarmine? I don't even understand this. But apparently he was extremely impressive, just extremely personally impressive. And that Hobbes had actually visited a mass as a young man that Bellarmine mm -hmm. um, 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 uh, presided over. Um, and, and came away that impressed and going through the controversies, all these arguments for integralism effectively and, and just trying to refute them. And it's, it's huge. I mean, this mm -hmm. dude, Bellarmine, I mean, we just like, that, that is awesome. I've got to read their letters. That just sounds yeah, that, great. I, they were assigned in an undergrad class. And, you know, I sort of took the, cause as Bellarmine's bringing up his concerns with it and I, I was like, these are the same concerns that I often voice to people about evolution in Christianity, where I get very concerned that we are now undermining fundamental parts of the Christian narrative. And I actually don't think that necessarily applies to geocentrism. And that'd be a whole separate discussion. I'm hoping to do a video about that at some point, because I think it is a more complex yeah, that's issue a big than challenge. people give credit to. That is, but, I think, but, like the, the more interesting challenge to your YC. You know, I, I kind of mm -hmm. want to see how you finesse that. Yeah. No, and that's that. something I've been working on for a long time and still really, I've been, people ask me about this like a year and a half ago, and I'm still at, like, feel like I'm at the beginning stages of having answers that I find okay on this, um, yeah. as I'm trying to work through those things. But yeah, their letters back and forth are just absolutely fascinating. And um, yeah, but I think in general, you know, there also are people in the heliocentrist movement who are someone like Kepler, who's trying to uphold the platonic idea of the harmony of the spheres of how the planets move around the sun in a mathematical motion he actually tries to argue that you get closer ratios to musical notes if you have heliocentrism than if you have geocentrism and has this platonic argument for um heliocentrism and so you know the church sort of reacts by just throwing all these works on the index without thinking about them really and uh, <laughs> newton actually almost included a final chapter suggesting that if there's a force unaccounted for all his math could be correct and geocentrism be correct uh I, and probably in part i wonder if to dodge the censors and he ended up not including it and i don't know all the details of that but yeah, um yeah yeah you know unfortunately yeah, it sort of gets I'm, there yeah you know, I, I mean, think, you know, almost yeah, when I get to what I consider a real issue, like um, really, I consider the big thing, Lyle's geology, where he tries to argue for a really ancient earth and undermining of Noah's flood. And that's sort of, to me, the, way more than Darwin, I find to be a huge problem. And at that point, the church has sort of run out of energy, I think, fighting any new learning that they don't even bother to engage with Lyle and his work just becomes widely accepted. And you look at Catholics in the 1700s, all six day creationists, you look in the 1800s, basically everyone overnight, I'm trying to trace down the details because Shabin mentions oh. a few people in his day who are still defending a six day view. And this is in the Catholic side and the Protestant side as well. Uh, the vast majority of the Protestant view for a long time was an older view. It wasn't until the mid 20th century that the six day view got revived. Wow. So, so let me give you, let me agree with that. And then actually that's number four. We've been talking for a while. Um, yeah. If podcast, you need to go, I can let you one. go. Uh, I, I, it's just too much fun. I can't even bear to, to stop it. Um, yeah. uh, so, 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 um, yep. Yeah, sorry, viewers. We're, things are dark. Um, I think, uh, well, okay. Hold on. It's just, I feel so absurd every time it happens, but then I can't. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So the number one uh, issue is that, people talking about human nature, not engaging the empirical stuff. What has to be done metaphysically is to integrate the physical stuff. Like the way to preserve the metaphysics is to integrate the physics or to integrate the biology. And, you know, and so many natural law theorists just like, don't do that. They think they effectively just do metaphysics. And then all the, you know, non-natural law theories like, yeah, this is just ideology trying to justify what the Catholic church says, but like, there's a way better way to do it. And I hope eventually mm -hmm. like in the volume two of the trilogy to, to do some of that. And then here's the third problem. 
or the third, because you gave one way in which, you know, when you take the new learning seriously, at least our new learning. Um, mm -hmm. If you look in regime change, Deneen, as a political scientist, talks more about Aristotle than any contemporary political thinker um, in, pol in political science. And it's very strange. I mean, it's, it's just very strange. I mean, Tyler Cowen made the remark. It's like, this is the last kind of time where you can sort of try to do political theory independently, completely independently of political science. Um, so for instance, he makes a variety of empirical claims about what Americans think. And there's just like reams of polling data that, that make trouble for it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm, I was really, I mean, in a way kind of like, like saddened by it um, because, you know, I actually think I've even, I've even thought about doing a Substack post. Like if I had written regime change, it just felt obnoxious, but um, I've really wanted to like try to be like, okay, let me soup up this argument and like do what I can to just like, like back it up. Um, but um, yeah, so, I mean, it, so, so, so the science of human nature, <clears throat> A and B actual political science. Um and, and, you know, look, Aristotle had a lot of really good insights, okay? But, like, it's been a while, you know? And, look, there's still a big part of me that's an Aristotelian Thomist, although, you know, you and Tom Ward and stuff are kind of... Tom Ward is a good friend of mine. Um, uh, pulling me... Yeah, it's a two affections thing. It's, there's, that's true. But nonetheless, um, I, I adopt that part and then, you know, adopt most of the rest or whatever. But... Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, you know, Aristotelian Thomists can do better than Aristotle and Aquinas did with respect to what they say about human nature. Ultimately, there has to be a reconciliation of the metaphysics and the, and, and the empirical sciences. And I think, you know, all the stuff we're learning about how humans make decisions, um, it, it just has to be relevant. And so this is one of the reasons, you know, I spent a lot of time doing empirical moral psychology uh, it, it was my next step of my trust project is again, part of what we're, we're doing with the, the, the pen project is um, we're trying to think through how people's capacity to trust strangers is learned and transmitted because it's really extraordinary. If you think about it, I mean, our ability to, you know, and I think you'd have some kind of YC story about maybe that, you know, we're all clans going all the way, like going all the way back. And so we always had the capacity to trust in large numbers or something, but it is pretty weird that at some point humans decided they could trust strangers with their lives. And it's a really hard thing to learn because you, strangers are strangers. Like you don't know what they're all going to do. Um, but the, the capacity of the person to kind of set aside their own interests because they trust other people to advance them, that can, that's a kind of rational choice. And so, you know, what I've done in my trust books is say, okay, look, I mean, maybe the basis of politics is civic friendship, but it's maybe it's a little too thick. So I say, let's back off to trust from friendship. The friendship requires trust. It's a little bit weaker of a relation and one we can study empirically. Um, and so I spent a huge amount of time trying to develop a kind of interdisciplinary concept of social trust so that the social sciences can inform political philosophy. Um, and um, so that's my own kind of way of thinking about like, here's you, like you bring in the social science. It does inform how people make choices. But the cool thing about this is that it's actually totally consistent with Christianity that we can fundamentally sort of unify with other human beings. Um, that yeah. we can be reconciled to them in certain certain ways, even and it's a it's God's gift that there's social trust, right? I mean, because we can trust people we don't know and that have completely different beliefs from us. And so the Aristotelian or Thomistic stress on social peace is that wow, hundreds of millions of people can kind of sort of can kind of sort of have it, and it makes sense both theologically and empirically. I think mm -hmm. that's excellent. Yeah. Well, we've That's been doing two minutes. This is this. I really do have to go. I'm I'm getting texts uh, 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 from family. Um, yeah, and I have three kids. I think you. How many do you have? One. I have one. A yeah, second one on the way. Congratulations. Um, Thank but, you. Yeah, yeah. We, we have three, so I need to go. I hate for it to stop. Maybe hmm. we can come back at some point because, boy, I think we both had a really good time. Like, I mean, this yeah. is a lot of fun. Yeah, there, <laughs> there's still like another like one and a half chapters of your book I want to discuss that we didn't even get to yet. So we'll have to. Yeah, I know we didn't even sure. get to the justice argument. Yeah, no, we will. They will. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I do have to run. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, All right. Thank you so much for uh, coming yeah. on, Doctor Valley. Well, do you want to plug your name, it. your book again and stuff? Oh, sure, sure, sure. So. Um, just, you know, all the kingdoms of the world on radical religious alternatives to liberalism. But here's some things you should know about it. If you go to my website, kevinvalier.com, you go to the book page. If you click through to Oxford, it has a discount code built in. So you can get it for 21 bucks, the hardcover. Nice. And so that's just one thing for people to know. 
Um, and I plan to have that link up like forever. Oxford lets you keep the discount code. Second, it's 15 on Kindle. Um, and third, we're going to, there's a few errata in it that I've got to get corrected. But the, when the Oxford Scholarship Online goes on, anyone at a major library, any graduate student or undergraduate, any of you who are listening, I'd love to get a sale. Um, but, um, you know, you, you should through your library be able to get um, access to OSO. Um, so, and I mean, I get some loyalties a little bit, but I don't care about hmm. that. Um, the loyalty is actually far smaller than you would think. That's not the fun. Um, so, so yeah. So, I mean, if you want a cheap hardback, 21 bucks, if you want a Kindle, 15 bucks, if you're a grad student or an undergrad at a university that has a subscription to OSO, it's free. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd Thank love to hear so from much. anyone. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I also want to mention you're really, really wonderful, I think, with interacting with people of different views on Twitter. Oh. You know, it's oh, be interesting in your Twitter comments sometimes seeing people of such different views coming together and having discussions because of who your followers are. So I highly encourage people to follow you on Twitter as well. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, it, it's it's tough. I did it on Facebook for a long time and then I migrated to Twitter and I thought it would be impossible. And so it's a struggle, mm. um, but I consider it a discipline. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll see it. We'll see when this goes up, but we'll also see you on Twitter. Yeah. See you. Yep. Yeah.